with regional divisions all too obvious. After being all but run out of parts of Western Canada, a picture emerges of a country divided. Between red and blue strongholds with slices of orange in between. Now, Justin Trudeau's priorities will become clear, laying out the future of his government and of this country. The environment, the economy, keeping communities safe, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. The stakes are high. As Trudeau attempts to lead his first minority government, the Liberal government has said it has to listen to last. The question now is, will it? This is the speech from the throne. You are looking live there at the Senate of Canada building. The red carpet rolled out for the beginning of this 43rd session of Parliament. The speech from the throne, which officially begins this session of Parliament and this government's work. Justin Trudeau, of course, with his second mandate now, but this time a minority government where he will be forced to work with different parties in order to get his agenda passed. Hello, I'm Rosemary Barton here in the nation's capital in Ottawa, just outside that Senate of Canada building. It's a little chilly today, but we like the way it looked out here. So here we are. Uh, so just steps away from where the throne speech will happen and not too far away either from Parliament Hill inside the West Block where uh, MPs have already gathered this morning to elect a new Speaker of the House and where many of them will make their way down to where we are for the reading of the throne speech by Canada's Governor General Judy Payette. All that gets underway in about 90 minutes time and helping me with our coverage throughout the next few hours. Two faces you know well, the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, and uh, CBC's own senior writer, Erin Wary. Good to see you both. Glad Hi. you're both here. So uh, throne speeches generally pretty broad, um, but they do give us some hints, I guess, of how the next number of months will play out. Vashi, what are you going to be watching? Yeah, they definitely give us some hints of what the priorities for the government will be. Primarily, I'm watching to see the way in which the Prime Minister, he's not giving the speech, but he and his office wrote it, the way in which the Prime Minister addresses what became so evident through the outcome of the election. And that, for me, is the issue of national unity or lack thereof. I'm really curious to see uh, what kind of language is used to address that and what the what the byproduct or the end result of all these meetings he's had over the past month and a half with various premiers and leaders from Alberta, Saskatchewan and Quebec, uh, how that kind of plays into what he says today. So that's where my eyes are. Okay, good. And we'll certainly talk more about sort of the strategy the Prime Minister's taken uh, over the 45 days since the election was held leading up to today. Aaron? Yeah, I'm looking to see how he frames or how the government frames this challenge of dealing with the other parties how uh, it wants to, to sort of walk the balance of uh, finding common ground, but also, you know, conceivably putting forward a mandate and mm -hmm. putting forward an agenda, and then what emphasis they give to certain topics. Uh, if you go back to, the, to four years ago, the m middle class was front and center. That was the campaign. That was the first topic of the, of the throne speech. So is that still where they sort of uh, build the backbone of mm -hmm. their government, mm -hmm. or has the, has the tone or has the the sort of issue spectrum changed to some degree. Yeah, and we, we've already gotten word that the middle class tax cut is the first thing on the agenda come next week when, when business really gets started. Uh, but to give you an idea of how this is going to unfold, because there's a lot of symbols and moments and ceremony throughout the next uh, couple of hours, all of it steeped in, in history, in parliamentary history, and in the way this country operates. So to give you a sense of what to expect, take a look at this. Until the Governor General delivers the speech from the throne, no business can be conducted by either the Senate or the House of Commons. And like many parliamentary rituals dating back to Confederation, this ceremony is rich with tradition. The procession begins with the usher of the Black Rod, officially the Queen's messenger in Parliament. A message from Her Excellency the Governor General. Dressed in a black tailcoat and bicorn hat, he travels from the Senate to the House of Commons with a message from the Governor General. Knocking three times on the Commons door with his black rod, a gold-tipped ebony cane, he summons the MPs to the Senate to listen to the throne speech. The usher then marches back to the Red Chamber with the parade of MPs behind him. But today, this pomp and pageantry is a little more complicated. Historically, all the toing and froing between the Commons and the Senate would happen in the same building, just a hallway apart at opposite ends of Centre Block. But last year, it shut down for at least a decade of renovations. Now, the two chambers are housed in separate buildings for the first time since Confederation. 
roughly 700 meters apart. So today, a caravan of shuttle buses will carry the MPs between the temporary House of Commons on Parliament Hill's West Block, down three city blocks across a busy main street, to the new Senate of Canada building in what was originally Ottawa's central train station. So that gives you a sense of what to expect and of where we are and of where our three reporters, parliamentary reporters, are positioned as well because this is going to move quickly from one location to another. Let's start with Hannah Thibodeau. She is outside the Senate of Canada building, the place where most of the VIPs will arrive shortly. Hannah. Yeah, hey Rosie, I am in the cold out here behind the Senate and this is where, as you say, the dignitaries will arrive. Traditionally, all of former Prime Ministers, also former Governors General are invited to the throne speech. We've already seen former Governor General Mikael Jean arrive to uh, come and watch this throne speech. We've also heard that there's going to be a couple of Premiers here as well. They're Northern Premiers, the Premier of the Yukon, Sandy Silver, as well as Northwest territories. Caroline Cochran uh, had a chance to speak with her this morning about this. She says she's looking forward to it. She's pretty excited to hear and that kind of gives me an indication that there will be mentions of the North and likely when it comes to Indigenous issues mentioned in this throne speech. So we'll watch to see who else is coming through here. We also know that uh, the Chief of Defence Staff is expected to, we'll see him arrive as well and the head of the RCMP. So those are the types of people you'll see come through here as we wait for the throne speech to be read, Rosie. Okay, thanks for that, Hannah. Um, this is, a, you know, this is a place where all the very important people <laughs> do try and get uh, an invite to. And uh, Salima Shivji is inside the Senate of Canada building, which, as I said there in that in that little piece of tape, this used to be the old train station was renovated in order to put the Senate inside. It's a beautiful building inside for people that haven't been in. And Salima, you'll be seeing people go down that red carpet there behind you. That's right. I'm here where the red carpet is, where all of uh, the uh, dignitaries will be coming in behind me. We actually, as you mentioned, this is a new situation. Of course, uh, the MPs are going to have to be walking or being shuttled over uh, in a different way instead of just walking inside the hallways of Centre Block as they have done in the past. So a little bit of a different feel to it here, a bit of a sort of anticipation since this is the first time we're doing it inside this new building. It will also be the first time, of course, the Governor General, Julie Payette, will be uh, giving uh, this speech from the throne. So we've actually already seen some MPs and ministers uh, enter uh, the Senate building here. Uh, new infrastructure uh, Minister Catherine McKenna walked in just a, a little while ago. Uh, most people really sort of trying to focus on, on what they will hear in this speech. Basically the ideas of finding common ground as we're in a minority parliament. Uh, we're hearing that from some of the MPs already sort of trickling in as they uh, the anticipation bills for this throne speech that should uh, start in the next little while. Okay. Thanks, Salima. We'll check back with you, of course, through the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Not everybody gets inside. Not all the MPs even get inside. They are sort of stuck behind a bar, and so only a few will actually get to hear how things go. But David Cochran's over in West Block near the House of Commons uh, to check out or to th talk to people as they come and go and, and uh, talk to him about what they're waiting to hear. Yeah, Rosie, if people are tuning in today for some big surprises, they're going to be very disappointed. I was speaking with a senior liberal this week uh, about what to expect in the throne speech. I said, will there be any news in this? And they said, if by news you mean new or significant, then the answer is no. What today is all about is about messaging and sending a message to the country that they've taken to heart the lessons from the election and they plan to govern accordingly and to send a message to this parliament that in a hung parliament in a minority situation that they're going to reach across the aisle and find a way to work with the other opposition parties. Uh, the path forward on that front, the Liberals believe, is with a progressive policy agenda. While this is a majority government, they do think there is a majority consensus for action on things like the fight against climate change, helping the middle class, reconciliation, and things like gun control to make communities safer. So these are issues that we've heard the Liberals speak about many times. That's not going to change. What could very well change today and going forward, Rosie, is the tone. That's right. Okay, David, thank you. That uh, so, so no news, but please don't turn us off because <laughs> you never know. And it is important to get the sense of where this government is headed and indeed how it plans to collaborate with some of those other progressive parties that it thinks it can make some deals with around some of those issues uh, David Cochran talked about. Of course, this is Justin Trudeau's first minority government, his second mandate. It is not the first minority government this country has experienced, but it's the first one for quite some time. So to get you to remind you of, of the things that minority 
majority governments can accomplish. We put together a little bit of tape that we'll show you through the next hour and a half of some of the successes that minority parliaments, minority governments have mattered, managed to come up with because indeed big things have been accomplished regardless of what the government looks like. Take a look at this. Lester Pearson's Liberals swung for a majority and missed twice in a row in 1963 and 65. Yet with NDP support, they universalized hospital coverage and Medicare, introduced the Canada and Quebec pension plans, the Canada Student Loans Program, official bilingualism, and the flag. And building on previous work by John Diefenbaker's Conservatives, they are credited with introducing the world's first race-free immigration policy. Like his son, Trudeau the senior found himself humbled in 1972 after alienating many voters. But his minority government did have some wins at the time. It created Petro Canada, a then state-owned company to help mitigate the pain of the oil crisis. It also amended the Elections Act to keep better track of donations and to limit campaign spending to keep things more fair. Welcome back here in Ottawa, just outside the Senate of Canada building. I'm Rosemary Barton. We are about 30 minutes or so uh, away from the arrival of the Governor General, Julie Payette. It is her first throne speech as well. She, of course, the Queen's representative in this country. And as such, she is the person that reads the throne speech on behalf of the government. So she hasn't written it, but she's going to read it. And that is what, of course, gets uh, the session of Parliament going after an election, after prorogation. Uh, and in this case, of course, uh, just about a month and a half 
since the election or so. I believe Salima Shivji, she's inside. Somehow she's inside and I'm outside. But anyway, Salima's inside and has a guest so far with us, Salima. <laughs> I do. We're nice and warm here inside, Rosie. And I'm standing with Michael Barrett, Ontario Conservative MP. Now, look, uh, obviously, we've just come out of an election where the Liberals were reduced to minority, shut out in Alberta and Saskatchewan. What are you and some other members of your party needing to hear in this throne speech to help sort of allay frustrations in those quarters? Yeah, look, uh, Canadians after just four years put uh, Justin Trudeau and his government on notice that um, what they saw in the past four years was not something that they were going to tolerate for another four years. Um, Every, uh, every month, uh, more than half of Canadians are within $200 of insolvency. And so um, with, with uh, personal bankruptcies at an all-time high, uh, we're going to need to see uh, tax relief. That, that's going to be uh, a very high priority for us. And also, with all of the uh, a litany of scandals that came out of the past four years, um, we're expecting um, uh, stronger accountability measures um, from this government in the throne speech. And, uh, and that's very important. In a minority situation, though, I think Canadians expect all parties to, to work a little bit together to get stuff done. How will your party take that into account? Well, you know, the, the, this parliament is going to last uh, exactly as long as uh, the prime minister wants it to. And, and if he's willing to, uh, to put forward uh, legislation that, um, that the opposition leaders have identified to him as priorities, um, we received a very strong mandate from Canadians to hold this government to account and to, and to get those things like broad-based tax relief for, um, for hardworking Canadians. Um, you know, uh, we're going to keep fighting uh, against the, uh, the carbon tax. We heard loud and clear that it does nothing to help the environment uh, and, it, and it only hurts uh, people, particularly in rural communities. And so, uh, like my riding, and so um, we're going to press the government for that. Um, look for real action, and uh, and that's what we're expecting from this throne speech and for the duration of this parliament. All right, thanks so much for talking to me. Uh, so, Rosie, you heard there obviously a focus still from the Conservatives on uh, the federal carbon tax. We do know that there will be an emphasis on fighting uh, climate change in the throne speech. Uh, those are some of the indications we have seen from the Liberals and uh, during the election campaign as well. Okay, Salima, thanks for that, and thanks for uh, snagging our first uh, guest, a Conservative MP in this case. We'll try and get other people as they're coming in and as they arrive for this uh, throne speech, the second for Justin Trudeau and his second mandate. Um, I'll go back to Vashi and Aaron here. I, I mean, so a couple things. I guess the Conservatives will be happy on Monday to see that middle class tax cut, which ended up being very much like a similar one to what they presented during the election. Uh, they may not be happy with other parts of this speech, but that's sort of how it's going to work when you're in a minority government. You're going to have some bones to throw to one team and then some bones to throw to another team. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, if the biggest signal they're looking for is tax relief for the middle yeah. class or tax relief period, they're going to find it. We know that. They've, the government has already said that will be the first thing that they introduce. I think what's interesting is the way in which the parties have kind of positioned themselves in advance of this throne speech. It's important to know in a minority context that like where the parties stand is actually pretty important. The NDP has kind of been the most specific about what they want to see, what they have to see in mm -hmm. the throne speech mm -hmm. in order to support it. That's actually one of the most specific things I've heard from conservatives yeah. so far yeah. about what they needed to hear. They haven't really said beyond that, we're going to probably not support it or, we're, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. there, there haven't been really strong signals on that other than from the NDP. So. Uh, I found his comments kind of interesting. Uh, and the the detailed demands from the NDP have been sort of, uh, I would suggest, odd for a party that uh, did not did not do particularly well during the election and is really not in a position to have another election. So I'm not sure if that's just uh, posturing, and I should expect that from them. Or, or I mean, I think I think you should expect posturing. <laughs> uh, Thank look, you. there's going to be yeah. every minority parliament. Uh, they can be very productive. Uh, but even the productive ones are full of posturing and uh, saber rattling and threats and demands. Mm -hmm. And then uh, either people don't, you know, either they, at the end of the day, the, the parties sort of have to decide whether they want to go to an election or not. The, the, the challenge for all of the opposition parties in this case is that uh, the liberals don't need one or the other. Like, they don't need just one party. Yeah. They can sort of bargain amongst the three of them. Uh, and they, there is enough points of commonality between, for instance, the Liberal platform and the, the NDP platform, or even the Bloc platform, for that matter, that they should be able to find room to deal. There aren't going to be, a, there isn't going to be a ton of agreement between the Conservatives and the Liberals. No. There will be maybe over tax cuts. There could be over NAFTA. Part, but for the maybe. most part, this yeah. most part, most part, it's going to be a government focused on trying to appease the Bloc and the, and the NDP. And. 
and the, the fact that we have parties dealing with their own stuff, for lack of a better word, the conservatives in particular, that also means that the, the saber rattling that sort of heightens as you get towards sort of the natural life, you know, end of life of minority parliament, about 24 months, that stuff too probably isn't really top of their list. They're probably not really interested in, in saber rat rattling, maybe criticism, but not in anything that's in any real sense. I think, yeah, I think especially for the conservatives, though, not say necessarily saber rattling, but they have an opportunity right now to try and capitalize on what's happening in the House rather than just face question after question after question about the leadership of their party. And that's I think that those questions are why we've barely heard anything about this session from them so far or about what they're focused on today for the throne speech. They have been consumed with very public calls for Andrew Scheer to step down now before their convention in April. And I think that's sort of reflected in what we've seen so far. So they have an opportunity now, too. Yeah, so it's probably good news for them. If there's a little meat on the bone, it gives yeah. them something else to talk about briefly anyway. OK, uh, lots more still ahead, including, of course, at issue, Andrew and Chantal are standing by in their respective cities to talk more about what they're expecting from the throne speech and then after it happens. Of course, they'll be on the national later tonight as well. But as we go to break, because CBC has extensive archives, uh, we dug all the way back and found the first throne speech to be televised ever. It was in 1949. It was 70 years ago. Take a look at this. Liberals, progressive conservatives, CCFers, and social creditors from every corner of Canada are gathering to consider the nation's business, your business. This is your parliament. Promptly at 3 o'clock, His Excellency the Governor General, Viscount Alexander of Tunis, arrives. He has come to open the session of parliament, which he, as the King's representative in Canada, has summoned. His Excellency the Governor-General wishes the immediate presence of this Honorable House in the chamber of the Honorable the Senate. And so, having been duly summoned, the Honorable Members rise and proceed to their appointed place. All are assembled to hear the Governor-General's speech from the throne. The North Atlantic nations, including Canada, are negotiating a security pact. You will be asked, without delay, to approve the agreement. And then it's over. The members of the Commons return to their own chamber, while parliamentary reporters rush to telegraph the new government program to the nation's press.
Paul Martin's big ideas were hampered by big problems during his troubled minority, but he produced two lasting policy wins, the legalization of same-sex marriage, a right is a right, and the gas transfer tax, which provides billions in funding that provinces and territories can spend on municipalities. You're looking at the Senate of Canada building. It is located just across from the uh, the Fairmont Hotel, the uh, Chateau Laurier, uh, and uh, just down the street from Parliament Hill, where the West Block is, uh, of course, the, the home of the House of Commons, and this, the old train station here in Ottawa, uh, home to the Senate, temporary home, as Centre Block gets renovated for the next decade or so. We are standing by for the arrival of Canada's Governor General in about 10 minutes, or just a little more than 10 minutes. Julie Payette will be arriving in this building behind me, where she will do uh, one of the most important parts of her job, and that is to deliver the Canada's speech from the throne on behalf of the government and as a representative of the Queen to get uh, the 43rd session of Parliament underway. And as such, there'll be lots of uh, VIPs arriving, elected elected members. There's more than 90 new members uh, who will want to see this probably in person because it is sort of a, a cool moment, as well as uh, there's some Supreme Court justices that have never seen it either, so they'll want to be in there as well. Uh, and of course, the, the uh, senators themselves inside the Red Chamber. Salima is inside that building behind me and has a guest with her now, Salima. That's right, Rosie. I'm actually standing with Taylor Backrack, who is a new uh, BC MP, uh, uh, NDP rather, MP, taking over Nathan Cullen's old riding. Now, you wanted to be here for this cool moment, obviously, the first time you're going to witness a throne speech in person. Uh, how, did, how did you prepare for it? What do you, what do, what do you, how are you feeling? I don't know if there's any preparation specifically that I did, but I wanted to be down here. I think you only get to experience this uh, for the first time once and wanted to be here in person just to take it all in and think about what it means and get ready to respond to it. So what specifically, you know, obviously your party has laid out their priorities, what they would like to hear, the NDP would like to hear in this throne speech. What are you going to be looking out for? Well, there's so many things that the people in my riding in Skeena Bulkley Valley will be looking for in the throne speech today. A couple of them that, that I'm looking forward on to hearing on their behalf. Uh, one is a really concerted approach to climate action, tackling the cri climate crisis. We also need to see some measurable progress on reconciliation with Indigenous people, uh, especially compensating the children and the families that were so affected by the, the recent uh, uh, situation around the Human Rights Tribunal, tribunal ruling. And then uh, the third thing is, is Pharmacare, a, a public uh, Pharmacare program for all Canadians. Those are three things I'll be looking for, and uh, we'll see if they're in the speech. Perfect. Thank you so much for okay. talking to me. Thanks so much, Salima. Thank you. Um, so there you go, uh, some of the priorities that the NDP has laid out already to hear in this speech, uh, and some of the things we did here on the election campaign trail from the Liberals as well. Okay, Salima, thanks for that. I just love a new MP when they're excited and still, you know, innocent. And <laughs> when they still have a little bit of enthusiasm about how things work here in Ottawa. It's good. Uh, it helps keep us all uh, less cynical. Um, at issue is here. Uh, Chantel and Andrew. Uh, Andrew in Toronto and Chantel in Montreal. Uh, not that any of us are cynical, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, thrown speeches, David said it earlier on, they don't generally uh, give you any news, but particularly for this government, starting off in its uh, first minority mandate, it does need to signal a few things here today, and it needs Needs to appeal to some of the things that that NDP MP, for instance, talked about there. Andrew, what, what are you expecting to hear? Uh, if I can put it in a phrase, they will be uh, reaching across the aisle but not reaching across the center. Uh, <laughs> everything in this government is going to be, as one would expect, aimed at trying to win a majority in the next election. The road to that majority runs through two things. One is recapturing more seats in Quebec, and secondly, to the lesser extent, rounding up the vote on the left that is split between the Liberals, the NDP, the Greens, and to some extent the Bloc. So they will not be, except for a couple of issues, trying to reach out to conservatives or conservative voters, mm -hmm. maybe on tax cuts, on pipelines. Everything else will be on, on the progressive side of things, trying to round up that vote and particularly pitching to Quebec. Well, that's where, the, that's where they have the most to gain, too, I would imagine. You put all those progressive seats together and there's a lot of room there. Chantal? It's also the natural thing to do. Very rarely does a minority government rely consistently on the official opposition for its survival, especially when you've just had an election that showed only two parties in contention for power uh, for weeks on end. Uh, so when they look across, straight across at them, at the Conservatives, they are looking at the party most likely to unseat them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the Bloc and the NDP 
have more common ground uh, with the liberals, frankly. So it comes naturally to, uh, to the liberals to try to make this parliament work mostly by appealing to voters uh, that supported the NDP and the Bloc, but the parties that represent them in the House of Commons. They need to make it hard for one or both of them to say, I can't support this. But it's particularly, I think, given the current configuration where the Conservatives have simply not been contenders for the centre ground. Mm -hmm. And until and unless they become that kind of threat to the Liberals on their right, then the, the, all of the gain is going to be, as Chantel says, in, in, in yeah. looking to their left. Okay, I'm going to put you guys on hold, but you, you will be with me uh, throughout this special to, to weigh in on what you're hearing and what you expect to hear. Thank you both very much. Uh, let me show you a little bit of what's happening here. That, of course, uh, Parliament Hill, center block that is now closed. You can see some of the scaffolding up and around it, but over to the, to the left of that, if I'm... You will see uh, West Block if you go further up that hill, and that is where the House of Commons MPs will soon be signaled to come down here to the Senate of Canada building for the throne speech and to hear directly from Governor General Julie Payette, who arrives in 10 minutes' time. Stay tuned for more. Welcome to the nation's, back to the nation's capital. I'm Rosemary Barton here, standing by for the throne speech, where we are awaiting the arrival of someone. <laughs> I'm, I suspect it might be the prime minister, but we're just going to stand by and see uh, who it is that's going to get out of these cars, because there's lots of um, dignitaries, obviously, arriving. Yes, it is. So that's Sophie Gregoire Trudeau and, of course, the prime minister making their way into the Senate of Canada building just behind us.
official rival of the Prime Minister and his wife for the reading of uh, Justin Trudeau's second throne speech, which will be delivered by Julie Payette, who will be also arriving momentarily here at the building behind us, the Senate of Canada building. Uh, Ottawa's old train station that has been renovated to include the Senate now as the center block gets renovated. That is the Usher of the Black Rock, Mr. Greg Peters. This is his big day. <laughs> he is the um, attendant to the Queen and uh, he will be uh, he will be leading the, the procession down to the House of Commons and asking them to come back here to the Senate to get the show on the road. Um, so, I, I mean, what, what are we what are we expecting uh, in relation to, I guess, what what that issue was talking a little bit about there, and what the NDP MP was talking about there, the the reach out to the obvious allies inside this House of Commons. Um, you know, I, I guess the NDP wants very specific things around pharmacare, universal pharmacare, which they're not going to get. They want very specific things around reconciliation which isn't going to happen overnight. So I wonder how do you reach out, um, or does it really matter when you can patch together whatever support you need? I mean, I think you do a bit of reach out in this speech. I don't think, I mean, look, he's not going to table a, a detailed plan of exactly what he's going to do and exactly, uh, you know, this isn't going to be a list of legislation for the, for the <laughs> opposition parties to vote on. You have to show enough that uh, the bloc and the NDP feel they can support this, feel they can say, yes, we should see what more this government has to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would be, it would be shocking if the bloc or the NDP uh, didn't support this throne speech or tried to take down the government over this throne speech. Uh, but at the same time, that's not you. The Liberals can't take it for granted. They can't be sort of flagrant in in ignoring the fact that they have to work with the other parties and they have to offer them uh, the sort of things they can support. Uh, Vash, I'm going to come to you in a second. But David Cochran has the government's uh, chief whip, Mark Holland, with him. So uh, let's go over to David. Yeah, hi, Rosie. I am here with Mark Holland, the government's chief whip. And, and Mr. Holland, this is a, a very different parliament that we're coming back to uh, than the one you were part of before the election. What do you need, what kind of a message do you need to deliver in the throne speech today to get the opposition support going forward? Well, Canadians were very clear. They want uh, us to work together. Uh, they elected a parliament um, where uh, no party has a majority. Uh, we've had excellent conversations with the other parties. I think that they all understand that uh, everybody's got to put a little water in their, their wine, uh, compromise, and, uh, uh, and, and making sure that we find a pathway to work together is the order of the day. And you're going to hear that reflected in the, uh, in the throne speech. And, and I should say there's a lot of common ground to work from. But we, we've gotten every indication from the Prime Minister, from people in the government, it's going to be a progressive policy agenda. So the outreach seems more obviously towards the Bloc Québécois, the NDP, and perhaps the Greens. I, is there anything that you feel that you ran on that you need to drop to make sure this parliament works? A policy initiative you can't go ahead with. No, I, I, you know, I look at what we ran on, and I think there's, uh, we can find somebody to work with in just about all of it. Uh, and there's also the opportunity to take some, uh, some ideas uh, that the other opposition parties had and work with them as well. So uh, the reality is that because um, because of the composition where we, we, we just need that one party and there are a few different to work with, um, that I think there's a lot of different uh, folks to do it with. And I think Canadians really expect us to do that. And I think any party that um, doesn't come in that spirit, doesn't come prepared to compromise and work together, um, is going to face a very uh, angry electorate. In the conversations that you've had uh, across the aisle, is there one party that has demonstrated more of a willingness to perhaps play ball or be more likely to, to keep this parliament going? No, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with members um, on all sides. Um, and with uh, meeting with the, the whips and the house leaders from the other side. Uh, no, it, it's been very congenial. Um, I've been very impressed with uh, uh, the atmosphere and the willingness to work together. Uh, now, we're going to have to see how that holds up, obviously, when uh, the rubber hits the road and hard decisions actually um, uh, move from the theoretical to the real. We're going to see how that holds up. But I, but I really sense a sincere effort uh, to make this parliament work and to find common ground. Okay, Mark Holland, we're going to leave it there. Rosie, that is Mark Holland, the chief government whip. Back to you. Okay, thanks for that, David. And you'll come along with other guests when you get them. Uh, on the right of your screen there, you can see uh, pool shots from inside the Senate chambers, uh, which is filled with dignitaries at this stage. You saw the former governor general, uh, Mikhail Jean. This is what's called a bench opening to Parliament, which means that they've removed all the desks that are inside the Senate and they've put in benches. So they can squeeze in as many people um, as they possibly can, including all sorts of invited guests and dignitaries. Um, Vashi, I guess what Mark Holland there is, is sort of what you have been hearing over the past 45 days or so uh, about how the government approaches this. And, and I should say we've, we've seen evidence of, of sort of 
I, I would say a, a kind of different strategy in terms of reach out and maybe um, subtlety on behalf of the prime minister, with the exception of the past couple yeah. of days. Um, You're you respected of the last yeah. 48 yeah. hours completely. It's yeah. true, yeah. though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I think it's important to note that they're talking a lot about the message they receive from voters yes. and the fact that they do have a reduced number of seats. And so today is another example or an, an example we can look to of how they're going to address that message that yeah. they were sent. And I think you're right that we have seen a very different tone, I would argue, from the prime minister. We've only heard him speak a couple of times yeah. since the election. When he's done so, other than election night, it's been you know, serious and acknowledging what the outcome of the election was. We've also seen him take meeting after meeting in the exact same position every single single photo op, I think there's been like 25 in a row, mm -hmm. has been him in his office working. That's very different from the kinds of photo ops that we're used to seeing the prime minister in. And I think that goes to exactly what Mark Holland was talking about. They're trying to convey that they took what the message that was delivered to them on the election seriously. Yeah. And today they're trying to make further evidence of that. Yeah, there, there's been some humility, I think is fair to say, yeah. demonstrated, as well as a lot of behind the scenes work that people aren't seeing. Uh, I don't know how many mayors the prime minister has called over the past 40 days too, because he knows the more mayors you get on side, uh, the more is going to happen here too. Okay, so just uh, so you can see here, here's the arrival of Canada's Supreme Court uh, justices, including the uh, Chief Justice, Richard Bagnard. Some of these uh, familiar faces to you, uh, Honorable Rosalie, Rosalie Abella, uh, Suzanne Cote, and others, others uh, here for the first time. Honorable Sheila Martin, for instance. These are the robes that are uh, fondly called the Santa Claus robes here in Ottawa. <laughs> this is in keeping with the season. This is in keeping, they're very festive. Uh, but these are their formal robes. Of course, they also have black ones. But obviously, the Supreme Court justices make their way. And this, of course, would be the procession for the Governor General as she uh, makes her arrival here. Just uh, behind where we are, we're in a tent, just uh, on the same street corner as Governor General. And traffic is not enjoying the hold up here. In downtown Ottawa's traffic snares. And there she is. Here's Judy Payette. Go! No, no! Les bons amis canadiens! Salut! Royal! Présenté! Out! Yes, that was, uh, there's 21 guns that have to go off and they're very near to where we are, so it's, uh, I think it's loud at home. 
or wherever you're watching. It's extremely loud here in person. Uh, but that's what the Governor General gets when she arrives for eventful occasions such as this one. Judy Payette, uh, appointed two years ago by uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, but this is the first time she's reading the throne speech. In fact, uh, the first... The first mandate for Justin Trudeau's Liberals uh, it was in one entire session, meaning they, they didn't stop, they didn't prorogue, and it was in fact the longest uh, ever continuous session of Parliament in history. Fun fact. Uh, more than 1,300 days without stopping. So that's why this is only Justin Trudeau's second throne speech and only the first time that Judy Payette will deliver it. She uh, expected to talk perhaps for about 20 minutes sort of what we're expecting, and she at the beginning of the speech can sort of do her own bit of introduction that she would have written uh, herself with staff, but the rest of the speech is really what she is delivering on behalf of the government and is written, of course, uh, by the Prime Minister's staff and his office based on the agenda and priorities they have laid out for them. 21 is a lot, actually, 21 <laughs> salute. Uh, it's almost over. You can see there inside the chamber, the red chamber of the Senate, uh, senators, of course, keep, get to keep their spots on benches, but also uh, Supreme Court Justices of Canada and special invited guests that the government would have wanted there, that the Governor General is allowed to invite a number of people. Um, and they get this prime seating to get a sense of what the government wants to do with its time um, over however many months this government will last in its current form. Is that issue still here? Can I talk to that issue? Is that a thing? Okay. Okay, so first of all, let me remind you of what you're gonna see over the next, um, well, the speech will start in, in about 40 minutes time. So let me remind you of what this is going to, what you can expect in about 40 minutes time. Take a look at this. Remember the two chambers, the House of Commons and the Senate are now in separate buildings, roughly 700 meters apart. MPs will soon board shuttle buses from Parliament Hill's West Block. They'll travel down three city blocks across a busy main street to the new Senate of Canada building. And once in the Senate chamber, MPs stay behind the brass bar to view the speech while senators and other dignitaries will be on the Senate floor to listen. Okay, and so that's why we are here, stationed outside the Senate of Canada building. Uh, maybe we can put the pool shot up just as we are. Wonderful. Don't you love it when everybody's on the same page? Uh, as we talk to Adi Shu again a little bit about what, uh, what we should expect. Um, Chantal and Andrew joining me as well from Montreal and Toronto, respectively. Chantal, uh, maybe let's just talk a little bit what we were discussing there with, with Aaron and, and Vashi, and that is the signals the government has sent over its approach. Uh, in terms of, again, it, if you take out the past 48 hours, uh, the way the Prime Minister has approached his job uh, seemingly differently, um, I think, from, from when he had a majority, and, and rightly so, I would, I would suggest. Uh, a number of reasons. Uh, it, this is not a new government. Uh, it kind of knows the ropes. A lot of the things that they will talk about in that Trump speech are things that got uh, started uh, four years ago. So even if Justin Trudeau had won a majority, you wouldn't have expected him to be taking selfie of himself and preparing a throne speech that would surprise you. Indigenous reconciliation, climate change, all those issues, even back, if you roll back the tape to uh, 2015, you will find that reading that first speech from the throne, it was the speech from the throne of a government that was giving itself two mandates to accomplish a lot of the heavy items on its agenda. So you're going to see a lot of those items back on the agenda. Uh, you'll probably hear about a few new things like the new NAFTA that wasn't on the horizon in the last mandate. But uh, I don't see all those signals as signals of uh, humility as much as uh, continuation, yes. the re-election yeah. of a government. That's fair. And uh, here on the right of your screen, I'll get Andrew to jump in in a second. You're seeing the Governor General, Judy Payette, arrive and uh, being greeted by the official delegation. So the Prime Minister, his wife, the Speaker of the Senate, uh, George Fury, the government's representative, for a little longer anyway, Peter Harder. Uh, I think the Chief of the Defense Staff is beside Mr. Harder. And on they go down this uh, official line, including the Commissioner of the RCMP, um, right there next to the chief of the defense staff. So, so Andrew, just speak to speak to that issue that we were discussing there uh, in terms of the government's 
it would seem changed tone. Um, maybe you don't agree, but it, it, it's outwardly it does seem that way. Well, we're reading all kinds of things about the tone has changed. We'll see whether, in fact, the tone has changed uh, in the speech and afterwards. It's natural in a day like today that we'd be focused on Parliament, but frankly, Parliament is the least of this government's worries, in a sense. They're in a rather strong position. They only need to get one of the parties, as we've been talking about, to support them, so they, they can play the parties off against each other. But meanwhile, they've got a gathering sea of opponents yeah. or difficulties outside Parliament. Andrew, I'm just going to cut you off, just because it's, it's hard to hear you and just to listen to this uh, part as well. That was the Ottawa River Singers, uh, First Nations uh, drummers and singers, you, that, and it was awesome. But you know, it's very hard to hear over that, so I had to cut off Andrew Coyne. I hope that's all right. Andrew, uh, let's pick up where you left off. And the last thing I heard you say was, it's one thing to suggest that the government uh, is, is going to have a different tone. We also have to see what they're going to do. Um, and I guess that's where we'll get a first hint of that today, maybe. Yeah, and as I was saying, they're going to have, the, the Parliament is the least of their worries, even though they have this very weak mandate with only 33% of the vote, um, even though they're going to have to deal with these other parties instead of just being able to, to govern with an effortless majority, they're in a reasonably strong position in that they only need the support of one of the parties to, to govern so they can play them off against each other. What I was going on to say was I think their greater difficulties are outside Parliament. And the way to think about it perhaps is to look back at when they last gave that throne speech in 2015. You know, you had Barack Obama as President of the United States, you had liberal premiers in Quebec and Ontario and several other provinces. Uh, China, it was still possible to be optimistic, perhaps, about the course of China. All of that has changed. They now have to deal with a, a bevy of conservative premiers. They've got Donald Trump in the White House, uh, Lord knows, causing difficulty. And China is increasingly causing pain and difficulties for us as a country, not least uh, with the holding of our two ho those two hostages. Yeah. So they've got a lot of problems to deal with outside of Parliament that are going to perhaps occupy their minds as much or more than, than dealing with Parliament. Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll let Chantal weigh on, uh, in on that before I jump over to David Cochran, who's uh, in, inside the West Block there. But, but Chantal, you would agree that the pressures are not only uh, inside how you manage minority government, but the external things, obviously, that you can't control. 
uh, managing a, a minority parliament uh, should be, especially in the first year, relatively easy. I mean, voters by and large are not screaming to go back to the polls to correct whatever they did on October 21st. But Andrew is right, and that will, in, when we look back in, uh, to the, the Trudeau years, we will see that uh, uh, circumstances changed on this government almost uh, as soon as it was elected. Think uh, of the Donald Trump election, uh, and I would argue that that meant that the, the liberal team spent a lot more time on events outside parliament even in that first mandate than they yeah. ever expected to. Now, if the economy is going to slow down, then that will be a, a, a bigger change that will call on this government for a lot more adjustments than anything that they need to do in the tone speech to ensure that they have the support of one party to go on in this parliament. Okay. Uh, thank you both. I'll be back to you uh, shortly, but let me head over to the West Block. I'm, I'll, my my co-hankers here, just, you're, I'm coming to you, so get ready. Uh, let's head over to the West Block and David Cochran, who's uh, with a guest right now. David. Yeah, hi, Rosie. We're here with Peter Julian, the NDP's House Leader. And Mr. Julian, in the run-up to today, in the throne speech, your leader, Jagme Seem, has been very explicit on what he needs to see to be able to vote for this when it comes before the House of Commons. One of the big issues is pharmacare. If there's anything less than a commitment to single-payer universal national pharmacare in the speech today, can your party support it? That what we're looking for is real change that is going to benefit Canadians. So we're looking for national pharmacare, uh, we're looking for uh, dental care, we're looking for supports that will make a difference in Canadians' lives. And Canadian families are the most indebted uh, in our history and certainly among any families in the industrialized world. And part of that is because uh, we're, the Canadian families aren't getting the supports that they need. We, we also want to see real action on climate change because that's costing our economy at now $5 billion this year and that uh, can only increase as we see more catastrophic floods and fires as a result of climate change. So those kinds of measures, are that direction is what we're looking for in this throne speech. It's not likely to be super specific. Throne speeches rarely Fair are. Enough. Enough. Uh, what kind of language on these issues do you need to see from the Liberals though? Because you know, if it's a recitation of, of what they campaigned on or similar language, that's probably not enough for you, is it? Uh, well, I think a speech, uh, a speech from the throne is an intent. Mm -hmm. what, do, uh, what does the Liberal government intend to work with with other members of parliament to achieve. And of course, we've seen a lot of broken promises from the Liberal governments in the past. Uh, what we're looking to see is clear direction in terms of addressing the affordability crisis that so many Canadian families are, are living through, unable to pay for their medication, uh, unable uh, often to assume the, the huge student debt load. Uh, we're also looking for real action on climate change. And I think more and more, particularly young Canadians, are concerned about uh, where our planet is headed. So those are the kinds of, of things we want to see in the speech from the throne. Of course, um, it's only a series of commitments that then have to uh, have to have to be put into real real place. But that's something that we're prepared to work for, uh, work with the government on if the government wants to take that direction. Just one last quick thing: we know there is going to be legislation probably next week on a middle class tax cut, raising the basic personal exemption. You mentioned affordability. Is that something the New Democrats can support? Uh, well, the, the, the whole issue of how it is put into place, the devil is always in the details. I mean, uh, on appearance, when you look at the motion, it appears that uh, half of Canadians wouldn't benefit from it at all, and most of the benefits would go to uh, uh, people earning uh, six-figure incomes and more. So uh, we want more of those details, but uh, of course our concern is when you're talking about tax cuts, uh, you're taking that uh, resource away from other things that could make a, a bigger difference in people's lives, things like pharmacare and dental care care uh, and other initiatives like that. So uh, we're going to look for the details and uh, hope uh, that uh, the government has thought this through. Okay. Peter Julian, thanks so much for your time. Rosie, that's uh, NDP House Leader Peter Julian. Back to you. Okay. Thanks for that, David. Uh, that is, of course, where, where the action will, will start shortly. The speech from the throne, we will expose to hear it start uh, being read by the Governor General at around 3.30 Eastern, so about half an hour's time. Before all of that, there's a formal procession. The Black, usher of the Black Rod has to go over to where David is on the West Block, knock three times and tell the MPs that it's time to come down here uh, and get this, get this 43rd session of Parliament started. Um, joining me, of course, here at the desk, Bashi and Aaron, uh, watching things as they unfold as well. We're starting to see uh, at least the Prime Minister's wife has taken her seat, so things will get underway. Um, well, I guess the, the, the procession part of this will get underway, not the actual speech. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, you know, I understand that, again, that the NDP has to keep this messaging, but I, I would remind people that the government also has to do what it was elected to do with the things that it put forward as part of its mandate. It can't suddenly invent new things. Um, no, but typically, I mean, this- typically speaking, I mean, I guess I guess if you're trying to reach some deal, you, you could find some middle ground on an issue. I just I'm not sure that the government is suddenly going to embrace universal pharmacare right. or free dental care. Those are not things that it it campaigned on. Yeah, no, I I don't think you can wholly reinvent yourself. But there is there is incentive for both. So there's an incentive for the NDP to show that they can get uh, results, that they can influence change. And there's an incentive on uh, the prime minister and the liberal government to show that they can work with these other parties to, to, to sure. move things forward. Well, how does that work for the bloc then, Vashi? Because the, the NDP, as we've talked about, uh, 24 seats now, not a huge amount of influence, but still has to act as though it has the, the, the ability to, to influence government and certainly will attempt that. The bloc, though, uh, in, a, in a completely different space than it has been in for almost a decade, with far more power, greater number of MPs. And again, it, we, even today, just at, after the election of the, the speaker, you heard from its leader, Yves-François Blanchette, about how you know, how he was there to defend Quebec, but not get in the way of Canada. Yeah, it's interesting because he has really prepositioned himself and his party as supportive of this throne speech from maybe three weeks ago yeah, already. Yeah. He has conveyed a message that he also received during the election, which was, and we've heard it over and over, we're supposed to be working together. Like you said, he's saying, I'm going to defend Quebec's interests. He hasn't been very specific about that, but I'm not going to get in the way of the other mm-hmm. stuff. I think the one place in which the prime minister can make overtures to both the uh, bloc and the NDP is through climate change mm-hmm. and the policy uh, that they might be signaling in this. There won't be a ton of specifics, as we've mentioned, but I think both parties are looking for more substance, and understandably so. Mm-hmm. The idea that the Liberals campaigned on more aggressive targets by 2050, let's say, will there be a bit more substance about how they plan to accomplish that or what we might be anticipating uh, from them. Both the bloc and the NDP have signaled they want to see more on that. I think that's the sort of easiest get for the prime minister through the throne speech in that area. Yeah. Yeah, we are uh, we are just standing by here, as you can see on the right of your screen, for the arrival of uh, the official arrival of the Governor General there inside the Red Chamber, Judy Payette. She will be accompanied by the Prime Minister, of course, uh, and that will that will sort of start start things in in terms of the next half hour, what has to unfold uh, before the actual uh, uh, before the actual speech is actually delivered by the Governor General. It's a very historically rich. Uh, process that has to take place, and you can see the, the, the throne that has been put in place, um, obviously representing uh, the Queen, uh, who Julie Payette also represents. I would point out that there's no MP allowed on the floor uh, during this period of time, uh, with the exception of the Prime Minister. He is the only elected member allowed on the floor during the reading of the throne speech. Uh, MPs have to stay usually behind a brass bar that is put in the opening of the Senate. And the idea there is to keep uh, the Senate independent from the House of Commons, to te- keep those two bodies uh, apart from one another. Here is the formal procession, Usher of the Black Rod, Greg Peters. This is his busiest day of work, probably. <laughs> he has a lot to do today, as well as the formal uh, procession there with the Governor General and the Prime Minister. And for now, the government's representative in the Senate, Peter Harder. Chief of the Defense Staff and the RCMP's Commissioner Brenda Lucky. This is the first time uh, not only that the Governor General will deliver a throne speech, this Governor General, it's also the first time in this building. can only uh, be recalled and get to work after this throne speech, after Parliament gets the royal summons of the Queen, represented here by Judy Payette. So the only thing that the House of Commons has done so far 
is elect a new speaker for the House of Commons, and that happened uh, earlier today with the election of uh, Liberal MP Anthony Rhoda from Northern Ontario. Bussier de Baton Noir, rendez-vous à la Chambre des Communes et informez-la que c'est le plaisir de son Excellence le Gouverneur Général que les communes se rendent immédiatement auprès d'elle dans la salle, <coughs> dans la salle du Sénat. That was the Speaker of the Senate, George Fury, formally asking the Usher of the Black Rod uh, to make his way to the House of Commons and ask the elected members to join them here at the Senate for the reading of the throne speech. So normally this would take, you know, a couple minutes. They'd just walk down the hall uh, in center block and uh, knock on the door and off he would go. In this case, he's, uh, he's going to hitch a ride down the street about 700, 800 meters. Uh, from where we are, uh, down Wellington to the West Block, where he will knock on the door there um, and ask elected officials to accompany him down here. And they will not walk. Uh, they will get into buses, uh, small buses that are used anyway to transport them sort of around the buildings of Parliament, and they will make their way here as well. Not everyone will get in. Not everyone will get to see things. Uh, and probably not everyone will come. People that have seen this many times before Probably the novelty is worn off, but some of the new people may indeed want to make their way down to see this in person. None of the leaders of the uh, opposition parties are expected to be in the Senate for the speech. They will, though, respond uh, informally in scrums after the speech has taken place. I should also point out that we are not expecting a vote on the throne speech at this time. Uh, it is not required. And so it, it won't happen. It will be debated, but it does not have to be uh, voted on. The first uh, confidence motion this government will have to face will be next week, and that will be a, a motion to release, uh, just to keep the government running in terms of money, budgetary motion. Um, and this is when it's sort of like a cocktail party, really, for lack of a better term. Uh, <laughs> they all stand around in the chamber and uh, catch up with people they know and, and meet new faces. and. Um, and it's interesting to see who gets invited and who doesn't. And it's always hard for me to remember the names of some of the people I'm looking at. Um, Vashi, what, what would you, I don't know. I, I, I guess, let's talk about Judy Payette. This has been her first time doing this. Um, it, she's had an interesting tenure so far. I mean, has. there have been, uh, there was a lot of reporting during part of it about how, she, the way in which she viewed her role. I had a chance about a year and a half ago to sit down remember, with her and yeah. interview her. Uh, she has a, a, obviously an amazing history. I mean, the, the experience that she brings to the role is uh, is fascinating. Her time as an astronaut, as well as her time in the military. she's She views the role a bit differently than others have, though, where, whereas they're just the queen, you know, not just, but anointed the queen's representative. She sometimes takes the role, um, you know, very analytically. She looks through legislation. No, she, she's a little more she's um, activist, hands on. even. Yeah, yeah activist yeah, yeah. and hands-on. So I'm curious to see, actually, if that impacts the way in which she delivers the speech yeah, today or the kinds of uh, things she says in introducing it, because that's where she does, ha introducing it, she does have a bit of leverage there. Otherwise, she's reading someone else's yes. work. No freelancing. Freelancing no. is really frowned upon in yeah, a throne speech. during a throne speech. <laughs> but, but things, I mean, in general, the last six months, to, six to eight months, things have uh, seemed to have normalized in her office. Yeah. Yes. The relationship between her and the government also seemed to be uh, less fraught with uh, different ways of looking at things. She seemed to s sort of yeah. acclimatize to what was normally expected of yes. the role. Yes, although she, she is also not living in the Governor she General's home. It was being renovated too, but she has not moved. She's living in a much smaller uh, mm -hmm. house on the, on the property, as are the Trudeaus, because that 24 They're Sussex neighbors. is not being renovated either. The only thing that gets renovated is uh, center block, apparently. Um, so that, again, is uh, near where we are, the Senate of Canada building. That uh, van there that you're going to start seeing moving is, is going to be the usher of the Black Rod, who's going to make his way down Wellington, really make traffic in the centre of Ottawa terrible momentarily. I got stuck behind an 
a procession that happened earlier this morning. It's Ottawa traffic problems. Um, and then we will uh, we'll bring you back to this in just a moment as he gets to the West Block and uh, knocks three times on the door, summoning the MPs. But first, let us remind you of where we were not so long ago. It's been 45 days since the election. Feels like a lifetime, but really only 45 days. The government has been busy getting itself um, set up, reorganized, uh, designing a cabinet, putting different staff members in place. But the prime minister before that spent 40 days, he and his party campaigning hard uh, to get to this place today where he is now beginning his second mandate. To remind you of what that election campaign looked like, here's Justin Trudeau's uh, 40 days in 40 seconds. In every election, we get to make an important choice about the future of our country. We get to decide what kind of future we want to build together. That's why today we're announcing that we're actually doubling our annual investments in child care. Cut taxes for the middle class. Gives the middle class some breathing room. Keep delivering for the middle class. For national pharmacare. Plant two billion trees. Ban military-style assault rifles. Breaking news tonight, a dramatic night in Canadian politics, a photo of him wearing brown face. It was a dumb thing to do. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm pissed off at myself. We were fighting on the defining issue of our time because Jason Kenney and Doug Ford and other Conservative Premiers don't want to do anything on climate change. Working hard on it. Tonight, you're sending us back to work for you with a clear mandate. We will keep investing in Canadians. This parliament will be one in which collaboration, in which uh, working with a broad range of parties and indeed stakeholders across the country is going to be incredibly important. All right, there, if in case you had blocked out the election, uh, which is <laughs> the way some Canadians reacted to that whole thing, uh, that reminds you of how uh, the Prime Minister got re-elected into this, his second mandate, this time a minority government. Um, as things get kicked off here, you can see now, uh, the Usher of the Black Rod has indeed made his way to the West Block. And again, a reminder that not everyone, uh, not all 338 MPs are going to get a chance to come down and actually watch this. Some of them will just watch it on TV like the rest of us. Uh, with me here beside me near the Senate building, Aaron Wary and Vashi Capellas. Um, it, is an exci it is exciting, a, a throne speech, not for the content. <laughs> Necessarily for all the rest of this, I I enjoy it. No, yeah. it's very exciting. It is. Yes. Thank you. It's a day to be a proud Canadian. That's thank you. Not everyone agrees. Some people thought, well, it's a little, it's a, it's a bit much. But I like that we keep the history alive, and we uh, keep the ceremony alive. Right? Yeah, yeah it's great. <laughs> You'll give it. Give it to me. Doesn't happen very often. We haven't had one in four years. We're gonna say. All right. Here's the moment we've been waiting for. A message to Son Excellence, the Governor General. A message from Excellency, the Governor General. Mr. Speaker, a message from Her Excellency, the Governor General. Monsieur le Président, a message. Son Excellence, la Gouverneur Générale. Admit the messenger. Faites entrer le messager. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mr. Speaker, it is the pleasure of Her Excellency the Governor General that this honourable House attend her immediately in the Chamber of the Senate. Monsieur le Président, c'est le plaisir de Son Excellence, la Gouverneur Générale, que cette honourable Chambre se rende immédiatement auprès d'elle dans la salle du Sénat. All right, so that is the official request by the Usher of the Black Rod. Uh, even those three bows, that's all part of the, uh, the ceremony, how this works. The three knocks on the door, uh, that's all part of the ceremony. One for the speaker, one for the executive, one for the whole of the legislature to let them know the crown is there and that it is time for them to attend. And now the procession will uh, leave the House of Commons in a certain uh, pattern as well. The Sergeant at Arms bearing the mace, which you see there, the Speaker of the House of Commons, newly elected, uh, Anthony Rhoda from Northern Ontario, the clerk, the table officers, and finally members. And you didn't see a lot of members in, in the House of Commons right now, and that's because as of this complicated issue around the renovations, they've had to either pre-position some of the MPs already at the Senate building or already load them onto buses <laughs> and bus them uh, a couple of blocks down, down the street. So some will go on the buses, some are already on them, some won't, we won't even bother coming, but we'll see. Um, And then after the speech, of course, which we are expecting to last somewhere around 20 minutes, uh, it will be an opportunity for opposition parties to, to respond and to sort of set their own tone for how they plan to approach the next couple of weeks. Because let's be honest, I don't think the House is going to sit uh, much past the middle of December, then probably doesn't come back until towards the end of January, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So the only thing that we would expect from them in terms of getting anything accomplished, Bashi, would be would be what other than the throne speech? I guess this tax cut. Yeah, the tax cut I think would be the the primary thing. I'd be interested to see if they're going to offer any kind of fiscal update because we've missed that this fall. So kind of a, a, and and for people watching, that would essentially be a look into where the federal coffers stand right now and also their outlook where the economy is that would concerned. Be yeah. Uh, so I would look to those two things as basically it. Uh, yeah. Like you said, it's about a week and then there's a big break and then the real thing kind of kicks off at the end of January. And that's when we'll get to see what everything they signal today in the yes. throne speech, where the rubber there meets the road and how that will actually translate or if it will actually translate into policy that they put forward and then ultimately is tested by the House. Yeah, I mean, so, so people realize not only is the government still getting staff in place, which is pretty fundamental to how ministers' offices run and whatnot, but but then uh, Parliament will also have to set up committees, and it's in committees where uh, that uh, legislation gets worked on, improved or not, amended, changed. And I don't. Uh, maybe they'll have time to put committees together in two weeks. I don't even know if that'll happen. They don't even have their man. The ministers yeah. don't even have their mandate letters. Yeah. That's supposed to come either yeah. later this week or next or Monday, week. Yeah. We don't know who the parliamentary secretaries are. Like, there's still a lot of question marks that are left to be answered that I can't imagine there's a whole lot of room left for legislation. No, there was a lot of pressure, though, Aaron, on the government to get back to work before, like, not just leave this until the new year. Yeah, they, I mean, they gave themselves uh, a longer time than they gave them themselves in 2015 to get set up. Yep. Uh, and uh, as we were talking about earlier, the prime minister had taken a very low-key approach to the last couple of months since the election. Uh, but you can't. You, uh, I think part of that, part of the reason they've taken the approach they want, they've taken, is because uh, he needs to sort of recalibrate who he is and how he's going to approach parliament and how he's going to approach government. And uh, part of that, I think, is showing that you're going to get start doing things. So you couldn't sort of cruise through December without no. turning up and moving forward with some things. And I think you also, to a certain degree, especially in a minority parliament situation, want to get some momentum built in terms of getting a throne speech putting some measures before Parliament, uh, get things working, get the parties used to how things are going to work, uh, and start working together, uh, start figuring out where your alliances are going to be, where your sort of points of commonality are going to be, so that you can come into January and February with a bit of a sense of how things are going to play sure. out. Sure. Uh, so just to people, to remind people, the last time, obviously it was a majority government, it was the first mandate, there was a certain level of excitement around the people that had been elected, um, that, that maybe you don't get a second time round. Uh, everything happened fairly quickly. The cabinet was named within two weeks, I believe. This time it took a, a month. Uh, and they were off and running pretty quickly. This time, it, you know, it's, it's been 45 days since the election. Uh, and yes, they've been working on things, but not nearly at the same pace, which to me is a is an interesting 
Um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting conclusion about what they've learned as well. Uh, I think it's a very different election, right? 20, 2015, they walked away with a strong mandate, like Andrew um, uh, pointed out. Yeah. That mandate is not nearly as strong this time. And I think not just was the mandate reduced, and it's a strong minority, no doubt about yeah, that, but yeah. they had very specific conclusions in that in Quebec, the bloc, there was a resurgence of the bloc, and in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they were completely shut out. So you're facing a, a situation that takes some time to work on. It's not something that you can say, okay, we have, a, we have this mandate, let's move forward, let's do what we have to do. There were some clear, as we keep saying, messages sent, and I think if they didn't take some time, like they had to come back to the House, I think, this year, just yes, because of yes. the pressure from the Conservatives yes. specifically, but if they didn't take that time, I'd be, I'd be curious why. You know? Yeah, and I, but I think you're right. If they come back in the next two weeks and give us at least a sense of what they are projecting for the economy, that at least will maybe settle some people uh, who do have some anxiety. This is a very odd scene that we're seeing. Just to, like in terms of history, yeah, uh, this is probably you know, very different. It's fairly yeah. strange. So uh, yeah, they are. And there that is, is the bus. Yeah. yeah, that's the Another prime minister's building now. there on the left-hand side of your screen, um, and these are the buses. Uh, that, that are regularly used to transport MPs and senators around to various places, just in case you thought that these had been specially rented. They are always there. Uh, so there's, there's maybe four or five buses that will uh, cram a bunch of MPs in there that have been chosen by the parties, will make their way down to where we are here at the Senate of Canada building um, to get this show on the road. Can I, can I go back to add issue for a moment, if possible? Just let me know when I can do that, just to get one more thought from them before we hear the throne speech. Um, they are, you can see why the traffic would be so bad too. There's only really one road in and around this part of uh, downtown Ottawa. Okay, Andrew and Chantal uh, standing by throughout this special. They'll be back with me on the National later tonight. Uh, just before the, the speech gets off to a start, uh, Chantal, um, maybe, maybe we could just go back to, uh, you know, how the government has been I mean, we know we've talked about change of strategy, but the reach out that it's done um, to so many different people in the past 45 days, uh, and the Prime Minister in particular, and what that is meant to do and what we might see of that today. I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of that today, but uh, I think it mattered. Um, sometimes doing something matters more than what it actually accomplishes. And, <laughs> and I do think uh, that in part, taking the time, talking and reaching out uh, was meant to try to, to heal some of the wounds of what looked like a regionally divisive outcome. Uh, and uh, trying to make sure that this isn't an issue outside of Parliament that pits, for instance, Justin Trudeau versus Jason Kenney, that there yeah. are uh, channels of communications, uh, François Legault, but also Valérie Plante or, or the mayor of Quebec City. Uh, and I think that was all part of trying to lay the groundwork for the polarization and the result to not become the defining feature of the House of Commons. And, and Andrew, the fact that, and so just so people re, to remind people, Justin Trudeau met with some seven premiers uh, over the course of the past month and a half. His, his deputy prime minister has been traveling, particularly in Western Canada, doing some of that reach out too. So I would expect and, uh, that, that that message of unity uh, has to be reflected here as well. Well, we'll see whether it is or not. I, Chantel phrased that delicately. I might put it more <laughs> bluntly that uh, that was essentially performative. Uh, the government wanted to be seen to be consulting. They wanted to be seen to be reaching out. Sure. So you send out a Christian Freeland, but you give her no mandate or authority to actually make any concessions. I don't think you're going to see, certainly not in this speech, you're not going to see much in the way of concessions. And I don't think you're going to see in this parliament. They don't, frankly, need the West uh, to win a government. Uh, and they don't see much percentage in jeopardizing their base among progressive voters and in Quebec by making concessions I, on I, pipelines I, or... or I, I understand uh, that, I, but is it not? But is it not uh, irresponsible of a prime minister to not do something? <laughs> to to no, not? Yes, go ahead, Chantal. Yeah. If I may, I, I was in Alberta twice or since the, over those 45 days since the yeah. election, and I, Andrew put it more bluntly than I did. We're agreed on the fact that uh, part of it is for show, but it did make a difference. Uh, uh, it did help. Uh, the premiers last week climbed down from some of the rhetoric that they couldn't yes. they couldn't stay at that level 
uh, eternally. So it did make a difference. But there's one thing I've never forgotten. I was in the arena when Pierre Trudeau gave his farewell speech to the Liberal Party. And one of the things that stuck with me was how he said that uh, the Liberals should never, or whoever succeeded him, should never forget that he or she is talking to actual voters, not just the elites. And yes, uh, you're not going to see a change in what Jason Kenney or Francois Legault want, but voters do see that and yes. are receptive to the impression yes. that there is reaching out. Yeah, and, 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 and Andrew, I may be being naive, but uh, I understand there's a political advantage to, to uh, showing reach out without necessarily needing to do anything. But I would hope, I would hope uh, that any prime minister would be invested in keeping the country uh, united in some way. And you, you can roll your eyes at my naivete there if you want. But <laughs> oh, of, of, of course, that is part yeah. of any prime minister's rule. Yes. Uh, in politics, it is true, is as often about gestures as it is about substantive policy, but we just shouldn't mistake the one for the other. Uh, I do also think that once you get, as I think, anticipate we will, uh, that you get the Trans Mountain Pipeline built, that will take some of the steam out. It won't by any means solve all the problems no. with Western alienation, but it will take some of the, the immediate steam out of this spike. Okay, uh, I'm going to check in with both of you a little bit later, if you don't mind. We'll listen to this throne speech as it gets going. Thank you very much. Salima Shivji has been in that hall uh, where MPs have been gathering as they make their way, some of them anyway, uh, to stand behind that bar there or that box that you see. Uh, and Salima, maybe you can give us a sense of what you've been seeing and hearing. Yeah, actually, we were seeing all the MPs that were already here at the Senate waiting for their colleagues uh, to be brought in by the usher of the Black Wad. They were all waiting there on the red carpet, uh, waiting patiently uh, to, for their colleagues to arrive so they could all walk in together. And you did see that procession just pass. Of course, we have to remain silent as that procession passes and enters into the Senate chamber. So uh, before uh, they arrived, we were actually chatting. I was chatting with some of uh, the MPs, the ministers there, a lot of them excited to see this for the first time, their first throne speech, yep. and also in s new surroundings, of course, right? Okay. Uh, in this new Senate building. So, All right, a lot of excitement. Thanks, Salima. Thank you very much. I'm just, I'm cutting you off only because we're about to hear, I believe, from the new Speaker of the House of Commons, Anthony Rhoda, and you can see some of uh, the members of Parliament, Cabinet Ministers gathered there behind him. The speaker is there to claim recognition of the rights and privileges of the members behind him. May it please your excellency. The House of Commons has elected me their speaker. Though I'm but little able to fulfill the important duties thus assigned to me, if the performance of those duties I should at any time fall into error, I pray the fault may be imputed to me and not to the Commons, whose servant I am and who through me the better to enable them to discharge their duties to their queen and country, humbly claim all their undoubted rights and privileges, especially that they may have freedom of speech in their debates, access to their excellency's person at all seasonable times, and that their proceedings may receive from your excellency the most favorable construction. Qu'il plaît à votre Excellence, la Chambre des communes m'a élu président, bien que je sois peu capable de remplir les devoirs importants qui me sont par là assignés. Si, dans l'exécution de ces devoirs, il m'arrive jamais de faire une erreur, je demande que la faute me soit imputée et non aux communes, dont je suis le serviteur et qui, en vue de s'acquitter le mieux possible de leurs devoirs envers la reine et le pays, réclament humblement par ma voix la reconnaissance de leurs droits et privilèges incontestables, notamment la liberté de parole dans leurs débats, ainsi que l'accès auprès de la personne de votre Excellence en tout temps convenable et demandant que votre Excellence veuille bien être interprétée de la manière la plus favorable leur délibération.
Mr. Speaker, I am commanded by Her Excellency the Governor General to declare to you that she freely confides in the duty and attachment of the House of Commons to Her Majesty's person and government, and not doubting that their proceedings will be conducted with wisdom, temper, and prudence. She wants, or she grants, and upon all occasions will recognize and allow their constitutional privileges. I am commanded also to assure you that the Commons shall have ready access to Her Excellency upon all seasonable occasions, and that their proceedings, as well as your words and actions, will constantly receive from her the most favorable consideration. Monsieur le Président, Son Excellence, la Gouverneur Général, me charge, me charge de vous dire que, ayant pleine confiance dans le loyalisme et l'attachement de la Chambre des Communes, envahir la personne et le gouvernement de Sa Majesté. Et ne doutant nullement que ces délibérations seront marquées au coin de la sagesse, de la modération et de la prudence, elle lui accorde et, en toute occasion, saura reconnaître ses privilèges constitutionnels. J'ai également l'ordre de vous assurer que les communes auront, en toute occasion convenable, libre accès auprès de Son Excellence et que leurs délibérations, ainsi que vos paroles et vos actes, seront toujours interprétés par elle de la manière à la plus favorable. Sénateurs et sénatrices, députés de la Chambre des communes, mesdames et messieurs, je suis heureuse d'ouvrir la première session de la 43e législature du Canada. Je souhaite la bienvenue aux 98 nouveaux députés ainsi qu'à ceux et celles qui ont été réélus. Your predecessors first sat in Parliament in November 1867. Canada was barely five months old. On the scale of world history, we are still young. Yet, much of it's happened in the world since then. We have matured, and we are here, strong and free. There has been no civil war, no foreign armies marching on our soil. There have been agreements and differences along the way. And lots of arguments, yes, most of them delivered with much eloquence in this very chamber. Notre stabilité tient à de nombreuses raisons. Premièrement, nous sommes des millions à avoir le même désir. Que nous soyons nés ici ou ayons choisi d'y venir, nous voulons vivre librement, en paix et en harmonie. Cette quête est une des pierres d'assises de notre nation et elle nous guide dans presque tout ce que nous faisons. Peu importe ce qui nous différencie, we nous avançons à l'unisson comme un seul peuple à la recherche de chances égales looking for et de points communs. Ce n'est pas un hasard, c'est un choix. This is not by accident, ce qui nous définit. It is who we are. And remember as well that our fortunes have relied often on the knowledge and the strategies of the indigenous people, what I call indigenous genius that allowed this nation to thrive. Their deep understanding of our natural world, their intense sense of community should continue to affect what we do here for the good of our communities and the future of, all, of our children. Kiji Mkweni, Magani Wiwat, Misiwe Anishnabeg, Achish Nigan, Abinuchi Shak, Ke Pimaditiwat. Reconciliation must continue. 
La deuxième pierre d'assise de notre stabilité est notre système parlementaire. parlementary system. Your work is vital because through it, we decide what we really want as a nation. The network of laws and traditions that define what it means to be Canadian safeguards our way of life and paves the way for the future we desire. Your role in the democratic process is a privilege and a responsibility. I know that you embrace it, respecting the wishes and protecting the rights of us all. Because we serve every single Canadian. Nous sommes au service de tous les Canadiens, quel que soit leur genre, leur confession, leur langue, leur coutume, leur couleur de peau. Languages, customs, or skin, skin colors. It is perhaps the most confiance. noble undertaking, undertaking we are entrusted with. La même planète. And we share the same planet. We know that we are inextricably bound to the same space-time continuum and on board the same planetary spaceship. If we put our brains, our smarts, our altruistic capabilities together, we can do a lot of good. We can help improve the lives of people in our communities, diminish the gaps and inequities here and elsewhere, and have a better chance at tackling serious and pressing issues like climate change, poverty, inequalities, and human rights. Because global issues know no borders, no timeline, and truly need our attention. Je suis persuadé qu'en travaillant de concert, rien n'est impossible. By working together, no I am convinced to that anyone can rise to any occasion if they are willing to work with others, to reach higher goals, and to do what is right for the common good. Cet automne, les Canadiens ont été appelés aux urnes. This fall, Canadians went to the polls. Et ils ont élu un gouvernement minoritaire à Ottawa. And they returned a minority parliament to Ottawa. Cela reflète la volonté du peuple. This is the will of the people. Et vous avez été choisi pour And you have been chosen to act on it. Nous ouvrons donc cette 43e législature en lançant un appel à l'unité dans la poursuite d'aspirations et d'objectifs With a call for unity in the pursuit of common goals and aspirations. Ici même. Here in this beautiful chamber, we recognize that Canada's Senate is increasingly non-partisan and measures will be taken to help it continue along that path. We are joined by the dedicated public servants who have vowed to work tirelessly on behalf of the people. Canadians have sent a clear message. From young people to seniors, they want their parliamentarians to work together on the issues that matter most to them. In this election, parliamentarians received a mandate from the people of Canada, which ministers will carry out. It is a mandate to fight climate change, strengthen the middle class, walk the road of reconciliation, keep Canadians safe and healthy, and position Canada for success in an uncertain world. These are not simple tasks. But they are achievable if you stay focused on the people who sent you here. Moms and dads, grandparents and students, new Canadians, business owners, workers, people from all walks of life. Every one of them expect their parliamentarians to get to work and to deliver on a plan that moves our country forward for all Canadians, including women, members of visible and linguistic minorities, people with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ2 communities. While your approaches may differ, you share the common belief that government should try, whenever possible, to make life better for Canadians. That includes better health care and affordable housing, lower taxes for the middle class and those who need it most, investment in infrastructure, public transit, science and innovation, less gun violence, and a real plan to fight climate change while creating good, well-paying jobs. But there are a few areas where this parliament can make a real difference in the lives of Canadians. And as much as they have instructed you to work together, Canadians have also spoken clearly about the importance of their regions and their local needs. 
The government has heard Canadians' concern that the world is increasingly uncertain and that the economy is changing. And in this context, regional needs and differences really matter. Today's regional economic concerns are both justified and important. The government will work with provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous groups, stakeholders, industry, and Canadians to find solutions. <coughs> Grâce au dialogue et à la coopération, tous les régions, toutes Thanks les régions du pays peuvent surmonter les défis d'aujourd'hui et réaliser leur plein potentiel dans l'économie moderne. Tant que économie. le gouvernement met en place un plan ambitieux pour As faire progresser le Canada, les parlementaires peuvent s'inspirer des Canadiens forward. Parlementarians can draw inspiration from Canadians themselves. Canadians have elected you to do important work. And they de model in actions big and small how you can be effective parliamentarians. Neighbors helping neighbors, putting community first, finding common ground, forging bonds, and working together. It, it is in that distinctly Canadian spirit of collaboration that the government and this parliament will build on the progress of the last mandate et feront du Canada and deliver a better Canada for Canadians. all Canadians. Canada's children and grandchildren will judge this generation by its action or inaction on the defining challenge of the time, climate change. From forest fires and floods to ocean pollution and coastal erosion, Canadians are living the impact of climate change every day. The science is clear, and it has been for decades. A clear majority of Canadians voted for ambitious climate action now, and this is what the government will deliver. It will continue to protect the environment and preserve Canada's natural legacy, and it will do so in a way that grows the economy and makes life more affordable. The government will set a target to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. This goal is ambitious, but necessary for both environmental protection and economic growth. The government will continue to lead in ensuring a price on pollution everywhere in this country, working with partners to further reduce emissions. En outre, Le gouvernement the government will also à rendre les habitations help to make energy efficient homes more affordable et des and afin introduce de measures des to build plus clean, plus efficient et plus and affordable communities. Il le choix des the government will make it easier for people to choose emission. zero emission vehicles. Il pour faire the en sorte government que will work to make Canadian clean, affordable power available in every Canadian community. The government will also work with businesses to make Canada the best place to start and grow a clean technology vehicle. company. And the government will also provide help for people displaced by climate-related disasters. Preserve Canada's natural legacy, protecting 25% of Canada's land and 25% of Canada's oceans by 2025. Further, it will continue efforts to reduce plastic pollution and use nature-based solutions to fight climate change including planting two billion trees to clean the air and make our communities greener. And while the government takes strong action to fight climate change, it will also work just as hard to get Canadian resources to new markets and offer unwavering support to the hardworking women and men in Canada's natural resources sector, many of whom have faced tough times recently. Canada's experience proves that economic growth is the surest way to maintain a good quality of life for citizens. Over the past four years, Canada has seen tremendous growth. And through it all, the government has worked to ensure that all Canadians benefit from Canada's economic success, cutting taxes, reducing poverty, and creating over a million jobs. And in this new mandate, the government will provide even greater support to the middle class 
and to the most vulnerable Canadians by pursuing tax fairness, continuing to invest in people, and growing the economy. As its first act, the government will cut taxes for all but the wealthiest Canadians, give her more money to middle-class family and those who need it most. The government will also act on housing. After drastically reducing poverty across the country in the last mandate, the government will continue its crucial investment in affordable housing. It will also make it easier for more people to buy their first home. The government will give families more time and money to help raise their kids and make before and after school care more accessible and affordable. It will cut the cost of cellular and wireless services by 25%. It will strengthen the pensions so that many seniors rely on and increase the federal minimum wage. Understanding that an educated Canada is a successful Canada, the government will give more support to students, be they new graduates struggling with loan repayment, or be they heading back to school mid-career to learn new skills. Le gouvernement continuera aussi de mener un programme économique qui bâtit une économie canadienne moderne. Cela signifie moving forward with the new NAFTA to maintain a strong and integrated North American economy. Dans le cadre de cet accord et d'autres accords commerciaux, les secteurs soumis à la gestion de l'eau seront pleinement et équitablement compensés. With many farmers in the dairy sector receiving their first checks this month. To ensure fairness for all in the digital space, the government will review the rules currently in place. The government will remove additional barriers to domestic and international trade for businesses and farmers and will continue with ambitious investments in infrastructure and reduce red tape so that it is easier to create and run a startup or small business. And the government will pursue a responsible fiscal plan to keep the economy strong and growing. Every single person in Canada deserves a real and fair chance at success. And that must include indigenous people. In 2015, the government promised a new relationship with indigenous peoples, one that would help deliver a better quality of life for their families and communities. Real progress has been made over the past four years, including the elimination of 87 long-term drinking water advisories, Equity in funding for First Nation K-12 education. The passage of historic legislation to protect indigenous language and to affirm indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services. And the completion of the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. But we know that there is still much work to do. Reconciliation with indigenous people remain a core priority for this government, and it will continue to move forward as a partner on the journey of reconciliation. Indeed, when indigenous people experience better outcomes, all Canadians benefit. Among other things, the government will take action to co-develop and introduce legislation to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the first year of the new mandate. Continue to work of eliminating all long-term drinking water advisories on reserves by 2021 and ensure safe drinking water in First Nations communities. It will co-develop new legislation to ensure that Indigenous people have access to high quality culturally relevant healthcare and mental health services. And it will continue to work to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action 
and the national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls call for justice in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Le gouvernement travaillera avec les communautés autochtones pour combler le déficit d'infrastructures d'ici 2030. Il poursuivra les efforts de collaboration pour que les autochtones puissent prendre en main leur destinée et prendre leurs décisions qui concernent leur communauté. Il adoptera des mesures pour s'assurer de respecter l'esprit et l'intention de les traités, les accords et les autres constructifs conclus avec les autochtones. Il veillera à ce que les peuples autochtones qui ont été blessés par le système d'aide à l'enfance soient aidés équitablement et en tant que compensés dans un système de compensation qui est plus important. Et il continuera à investir dans les the priorités autochtones en collaboration avec les indigenous partenaires, in collaboration with indigenous partners. Le chemin de la réconciliation est long. The path to reconciliation is long. Le but in this, dans ses actions but et in ses its actions and the interactions, the government will continue to work to walk it with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Wherever they live, in small rural communities or in big cities in the foothills of the Rockies or the fishing villages along our coastlines, in the far north or along the Canada-US border, all Canadians want to make Canada a better place for themselves, their children, and their communities. <coughs> but there are challenges in making that better future a reality. Year after year, headline after headline, Canadians have seen firsthand the devastating effect of gun violence. Too many lives lost, too many families shattered. It is time to show courage and strengthen gun control. The government will crack down on gun crime, banning military-style assault rifles and taking steps to introduce a buyback program. Municipalities and communities that want to ban handguns will be able to do so. And the government will invest to help cities fight gang-related violence. Nous sommes aujourd'hui à la veille du We are on the eve of the 30th anniversary of the horrible killing of 14 women at L'Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. A day when all Canadians pause to remember and honor those women who were killed because of their gender. And we take stock of the harm that gender-based violence continues to do to Canadian society. The government will take greater steps to address gender-based violence in Canada, building on the gender-based violence strategy and working with partners to develop a national action plan. Ensuring a better quality of life for Canadians also involves putting the right support in place so that when people are sick, they can get the help they need. The government will strengthen health care and work with the provinces and territories to make sure all Canadians get the high quality care they deserve. The government will work with provinces, territories, health professionals and experts in industry and academia to make sure that all Canadians can access a primary care family doctor. The government will partner with provinces, territories, and health professionals to introduce mental health standards in the workplace and to make sure that Canadians are able to get mental health care when they need it. And the government will make it easier for people to get the help they need when it comes to opo opioids and substance abuse. Canadians have seen the widespread harm caused by the use of opioids in this country. More needs to be done, and more will be done. Too often, Canadians fall, who fall sick suffer twice, once from becoming ill, and again from financial hardship caused by the cost of their medications. Given this reality, pharmacare is the key missing piece of universal health care in this country. The government will take steps to introduce and implement national pharmacare so that Canadians have the drug coverage they need. 
Finalement, le gouvernement continuera de reconnaître son devoir solennel d'appuyer les personnes qui choisissent de servir dans les forces armées canadiennes. Dans son dernier mandat, le gouvernement a investi plus de 10 milliards de dollars afin de créer des résultats plus rapides pour les combattants. Puis, dans cette nouvelle législature, le gouvernement s'appuiera sur le travail déjà réalisé en améliorant le soutien de soins de santé mentale and helping ensure that every homeless veteran has a place to call home. Canadians expect their leaders to stand up for the values and interests that are at core to Canada's prosperity and security. Democracy, human rights, and respect for international law. Canadians expect the government to position Canada and Canadians for success in the world. As a trading nation, the government will seek out opportunities for Canadian commerce, ingenuity, and enterprise. As a coalition builder, the government will build partnerships with like-minded countries to put Canada's expertise to work on a global scale in areas like the promotion of democracy and human rights, the fight against climate change and for environmental protection, and the development and ethical use of artificial intelligence. Le Canada est un allié et le gouvernement apportera sa contribution aux efforts multilatéraux pour faire de ce monde un endroit un peu plus sûr, plus safe, just, prospère et durable. Le gouvernement renouvellera l'engagement du Canada à l'égard de l'OTAN et du maintien de la paix dans le contexte des Nations Il défendra l'ordre international fondé sur les règles lorsque cet ordre est remis en question, when that order is put in question, particularly when it comes to matters of trade and digital policy. Et il continuera de veiller à ce que la voix du Canada soit entendue à l'ONU et en particulier au Conseil de sécurité de l'ONU. Finalement, le Canada est un partenaire compatissant et le gouvernement fournira des ressources ciblées pour l'aide au développement international, notamment pour investir dans l'éducation et les études des sciences. Il aidera les personnes les plus pauvres et les plus vulnérables du monde à améliorer leur qualité de vie et à ensuite devenir de solides partenaires du Canada. Chers parlementaires, le Canada est un partenaire compatissant et le gouvernement fournira des ressources. Les Canadiens comptent sur vous pour Canadians lutter contre les changements climatiques, to fight climate change, pour renforcer la classe moyenne, strengthen the middle class, pour parcourir le chemin de la réconciliation, walk the road of reconciliation, assurer la santé et la sécurité keep Canadians des Canadiens, safe and healthy, et placer le Canada and en position Canada for success pour in an uncertain world. Et je sais que vous pouvez y arriver and with good grâce will, à votre bonne volonté, humility, à votre humilité et à votre willingness to collaborate, à ensemble. You can do that. N'hésitez pas à fixer des exigences you can raise plus ambitieuses the bar on what is, en ce qui a trait on what politics is à la like façon de faire country. de la politique au pays. Après tout, After all, le gouvernement sait qu'il doit travailler knows avec les parlementaires pour obtenir des résultats. To deliver results. Le mandat de cette récente élection est the un point de départ, mais non le dernier mot. Le gouvernement est réceptif aux the nouvelles idées provenant de tous les parlementaires, from all parliamentarians, les partis intéressés, stakeholders, les public servants et les Canadiens. Des idées comme les soins de dent dentaires universels like universal méritent d'être étudiées. Et j'encourage le Parlement à regarder ça. And I encourage Parliament to look into this. Whether it's fighting money laundering or making parental benefits tax-free, there are good ideas across parties, and this government is ready to learn from you and work with you in the years ahead. Some believe that minority governments are incapable of getting things done, but Canada's history tells us otherwise. Canada's parliament is one of the most enduring and vital institutions in the democratic world. It has delivered a tremendous way of life for the Canadian people through crisis and prosperity, through majority and minority governments. On December 31st, 1966, Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson welcomed Canada's centennial year and lit the centennial flame in front of the Parliament buildings for the first time. In his remarks, he said, 
Tonight, we begin a new chapter in our country's story. Let the record of that chapter be one of cooperation and not conflict, of dedication and not division, of service, not self, of what we can give, not what we can get. Let us work together as Canadians to make our country worthy of its honored past and certain of its proud future. In this 43rd Parliament, you will disagree on many things, but you will agree on a great many more. Focus on your shared purpose, making life better for the people you serve. Never forget that it is an honor to sit in this Parliament. Prove to Canadians that you are worthy holders of those seats and worthy stewards of this place. Members of the House of Commons, you will be asked to appropriate the funds to carry out the services and expenditures authorized by Parliament. Honorable members of the Senate and members of the House of Commons, as you carry out your duties and exercise your responsibilities, may you be guided by divine providence. And there you have it, 28 and a half minutes later, more than 3,000 words, Julie Payette has opened officially the 43rd session, 43rd session of Canada's parliament and stated uh, on behalf of the government, the government's priorities over the course of its next mandate as a minority government for however long it may last. That is the uh, official part of, of this speech, although there'll be some more procedural bits and pieces here that we will see as, uh, as the ceremony wraps up. And then of course, we'll start to get some reaction both from people uh, in government and from the official opposition members. <clears throat> So Vashi Capellas and Aaron Wary are here with me still um, and have been listening over the past 28 and a half minutes uh, to, to the speech that was delivered by Judy Payette the first time um, that she has presented this speech. I will say that it flies by in part because it is not like a, a State of the Union address, for instance, in the United States. Clapping is not uh, allowed. It is frowned upon as is booing or any sort of reaction at all. It's all very polite and Canadian and efficient. And so uh, that's why it happens very quickly and with very little reaction. The reaction comes after it's over and after the MPs depart, as they will shortly. Uh, so Vashi, maybe as we just keep these pictures up and watch as people start to make their way back to the House of Commons and get to work, uh, whether there's anything that, that struck you there. A couple of things. I think the first is the level of specificity. Usually thrown speeches, as we uh, were discussing prior to the start of this one, are the broad strokes they signal the intent of the government. Although uh, they did that in this, they also had a lot of very specific things. Granted things that they had promised sure. in the campaign, so they don't come as a surprise, but including things like you're going to reduce cell phone bills by 25% is a very specific thing to include in this thrown speech. The second thing that struck me sort of corresponds with what I said at the outset of the program was, how, in what way will they try to address some of the issues uh, that have to do with the outcome of the election, particularly yep. in Alberta and in Saskatchewan, and maybe even in Quebec? And there wasn't a lot there. Uh, my guess is that the opposition, particularly the Conservatives, will jump on that. There's one sort of phrase where they said, they'll work as hard on climate change, after de detailing very specific things they're going to do, they'll work as hard on climate change uh, as they will on getting natural resources mm -hmm. to market, which is a nod to the pipeline thing, but yeah. I, I don't think I heard the word pipeline. No. I, I'm not sure there, was, there wasn't there was much specificity there. So my guess is that the opposition will jump on that. Although they did talk a lot about uh, the, the message they received from regions of Canada yes. and how the needs are different mm -hmm. in different regions um, and, and how they will have to respond to that. I'll get Aaron to weigh in in just a minute, but first Salima Shivji, uh, I believe is with the finance minister, Bill Morneau. Salima. 
Hi, I'm standing here with Finance Minister uh, Bill Morneau. I wanted to ask you, uh, what was the message sent with this throne speech uh, this afternoon? What, what's the main message that you wanted Canadians to hear about this new minority government? Well, there are a number of messages, but I think you heard an overarching theme that we want to make this parliament work. We want to make sure that we respect the views of Canadians, that we work together with all people in parliament to get things done. And you heard some key messages about what we want to get done. We want to make sure that we deal with the anxiety that people are feeling in terms of their economics, that we get at climate change and recognize that we, we really need to take action. And you heard some other things that are important, you know, keeping Canadians healthy, gun safety, some things that we know that people were talking about during the election and that we intend on going, moving forward on. The first order of business, as we've heard already uh, from the Prime Minister, that there will be that uh, tax cut for lower income and middle income Canadians. Uh, also, uh, will there be an economic update coming next week from you? We, uh, we're working to make sure that we are able to update people. I'll be able to tell you when that's happening in the coming days, but certainly we want people to keep abreast of, of how the government's doing and how the economy's doing, and that'll be one of my first orders of business. And you did hear that we want to move forward on a middle-class tax cut. We, during the course of the election campaign, we said that we wanted to make sure that we could give people a, a greater ability to have enough money to raise their families, and, and so we're going to move forward with that, and that'll give you know everybody except for the wealthiest Canadians a tax reduction. So is that there will be an economic update next week? I'm I'm going to get back to you on the actual timing, but I'm surely going to get back to Canadians to make sure they understand how our economy is doing. Before Christmas then? Watch this space. Okay. I did my best. Thank okay. you so much, okay. Minister Thanks Morneau. Okay. Thanks so much. There you go, Rosie. <laughs> That was very good. I, I take that as next week myself. So uh, <laughs> he didn't want to give it to you right there, but very well done. Thank you, Salim. I appreciate it. Uh, so again, the, the middle class tax cut we're expecting uh, as early as Monday. And it sounds as though a fiscal update uh, very quickly. And, and Morneau will nail down a date once he's got that sorted. Uh, Aaron, I guess your perspective on, on what you heard there from the speech. Uh, I mean, I, I think it, there's obviously uh, a recognition that they're, they're in a different situation, the amount of an emphasis on collaboration and working together in yeah. Parliament. Uh, I thought it was, if there was one big line, I think, where they, 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 they seemed very interested in hitting, it was that idea that children and grandchildren, our children and grandchildren will judge us based on, on how, on what we do or don't do on climate change. That's, you know, if you go back four years, uh, climate change was a part of the throne speech, but it was it was the third topic. It was more about the environment. Uh, it wasn't given nearly the emphasis it was given this time around. I think also on reconciliation, the amount of emphasis, I mean, that's not a new topic for this government by any stretch. It's not a new topic for this prime minister, but the amount of emphasis they gave on it, uh, the slightly defensive, I think, uh, approach of, of listing off what they had done in the first four years, and then the pledge to keep going, that has been a tough, issue for them politically to get credit for uh, and a tough uh, issue for them to sort of uh, claim success on. But there was, uh, there's no shying away from it in this throne speech. And if anything, it seemed almost like they were doubling down on mm -hmm. how much emphasis they want to well, put on it, it. It got its own section, as I mentioned to you, as they were talking, which it didn't actually get in 2015. And it also put uh, very clearly, uh, putting UNDRIP uh, in place, the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, uh, by the first year. So it, it, there are some moments like that that gave you timelines. Uh, I'll come back to you two in just a moment. Salima's got another guest with her right now. Salima. Hi, obviously, Rosie, I'm standing here with Parliamentary Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Um, we heard a lot about climate change in that throne speech, uh, basically a, an acknowledgement from the Liberal government that Canadians voted for more ambitious action on climate change. And a couple of the, the planks that we heard in their election campaign, what did you make of what you heard? It was largely what we expected. I mean, we, I'd written the Prime Minister uh, in late October saying, here are the broad areas where I think you'll find consensus among many parties. The need for pharmacare, the need to act on climate change, reconciliation being very important. So we, we look at those issues, they're all referenced, and some with more specifics than others. So I'd say the reconciliation agenda had some timelines. We're going to get to the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples legislation in the first year. On climate change, not so much specificity, nothing new. We are in the middle of negotiations right now at COP25 in Madrid. Now is when Canada should put forward the target that is actually grounded in the science. The speech from the throne said the science is clear. 
but Canada's climate target isn't consistent with that science. So we, we will wait and we will push, but it's clear that the, 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 the Liberals heard the message. Canadians want climate action. We just have to see if they're serious and when we'll see real climate action consistent with the science. What do you take from that, that there weren't specific details in terms of making uh, it to the target of net zero emissions by 2050, that those were not in this? Yeah, net zero by 2050 is a good target. The uh, Liberals took it on during the election campaign. They promised legislation as reference for every five years a target. Here's the reality. Our current target at 2030, which we're still not on track to meet, meeting that target means you can't get there from here. The 2030 target is too weak to be a springboard to the 20. 50 target. We need to improve our target quickly, preferably years ago, but at least now. So I'm, I, I, what I take from that is that uh, they're giving us the rhetoric of climate action and we're going to need to keep pushing and the climate movement of citizens across Canada needs to keep pushing. All right. Thank you so much, you. Elizabeth May, Green Party parliamentary leader. Back to you, Rosie. Okay, thanks for that, Salima, and thanks to uh, Liz May, Elizabeth May. Uh, there on the right side of your screen, you can see a gripping, empty microphone in front of the House of Commons. We are expecting opposition leaders to make their way there and give us their, give us their impressions of the speech. Uh, so we will stand by, and it looks like someone's moving into position, maybe. Um, until that happens, let me bring in uh, at issue uh, Chantal and Andrew. Uh, Andrew, why don't you go first about uh, what, what you made of that? Uh, national divisions, uh, what national divisions? There's some regional concerns, maybe a couple of regional needs, uh, but very little uh, of substance on that. There was a long passage, of course, about climate change, at the end of which there's a throwaway line about moving resources to markets. There's a long passage about all the money they're going to give to various groups in society, and then there's a line about responsible fiscal plan. <laughs> Um, no mention of the deficit, no mention of productivity. This is absolutely aimed at progressive voters, absolutely not aimed at a big reach out to the West, um, and I'm not particularly surprised. I, I'm just, before Chantal, I get you, I'm just going to listen in to the government's house leader, Pablo Rodriguez, who's uh, taking some questions. Moi, j'ai eu la. C'est du cas par cas. Et ça va toujours être du cas par cas. Euh, J'ai eu l'opportunité de rencontrer les trois leaders du gouvernement. J'ai eu l'opportunité de rencontrer les trois leaders du gouvernement cette semaine. The, for the NDP, the Bloc and the, the uh, Conservatives, and I felt the, the desire to collaborate, it will be on a case-by-case -case basis. For instance, on bills regarding uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, well, it would be natural to do it, uh, that with the NDP and the Bloc, and reducing uh, uh, the middle-class taxes, well, maybe the Conservatives will come along. The door is open anyway. Do you, where do you think the support will come from? Well, I'm open to discussions. I discuss with them this week. I intend to discuss with my counterparts almost on a daily basis, so I'm waiting for their reactions. I think this is a speech that reflects what we heard from Canadians. That is that we must and we should collaborate and we will collaborate. With other parties, and we heard it today in the House about decorum and improving it. How do you intend on doing that and what are you going to do to reach out to the other parties by, by to talking try to, to change the decorum? I think it's fundamental that we talk to each other. This is exactly what I did this week. I spoke with, uh, we had three, I had three private meetings with the House leaders, Conservatives, the NDP, and the Black Quebecois. Uh, they all have now have my cell phone. They can call me anytime. Uh, my door is always open, and uh, I'm ready to have those conversations. And you know what? We said in the Rotom speech, good ideas can come from anybody. Okay. That's uh, the Liberal House leader, uh, Pablo Rodriguez. Only dipped into that because he's the guy who's obviously going to be in charge of trying to reach these agreements on a case-by-case -case basis on uh, confidence votes when it comes to that. Um, apparently he's given his cell phone out to everybody, uh, all the other House leaders, in case they need to call him and discuss something. Sorry, I jumped uh, into our discussion with that issue. Didn't give Chantal yet a chance to respond to what she heard in the throne speech and whether there's anything that stood out for you just as the Prime Minister uh, leaves the space where we are right now. Chantal, what, what did you, what, what struck you about all that? Uh, there is a clear effort to tick boxes uh, for the NDP or even the Bloc uh, to support the, uh, the agenda of the government. You know, you throw in a line about uh, free dental care, uh, saying we're going to implement a national pharma care program, easier said than done, by the way. The dairy farmers' compensation yes. checks yes. will be rolling out. That's important to the Bloc. Um, so I, what, what struck me beyond those 
box ticking exercises, which this is probably the Tron speech that uh, gives the most space to an environmental issue that we have ever seen. Uh, and it couldn't be more different than the Tron speech that uh, a conservative minority government would have tried to put together with the emphasis on uh, doubling down on climate change. I think it is the kind of Tron speech that uh, voters uh, who supported the liberals, but also the NDP and the Bloc <coughs> probably expected. I noted, like Andrew, that uh, the word pipeline or trans mountain is not in there. And I think at the end of the day, the liberals uh, worried that the NDP and the Bloc would choke on that word. And mm. so they went with getting our resources to market to make mm -hmm. sure that this would not stick uh, and be too hard to swallow for the parties they're hoping to get support from. I, I think that those are all good points. And I, I would also suggest, and I'll get you to Andrew to weigh in, they also put a line in about, well, the carbon tax, but they call it price on pollution, because again, that's less uh, sort of trigger a trigger word. They said, we'll ensure a price on pollution everywhere in this country. Sort of, uh, you know, casually signaling to those premiers that still don't like it, it this isn't, we're, we're not backing away from this. If anything, as Chantal said, we're, we're going harder. Well, that would have been huge news, but I suspect the government might have had a hard time surviving that first vote if it had said 100%. we're backing away yeah. from carbon pricing yes. after yes. all this. Yes, right. yes, but 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 to say to, but to say to the provinces, just like don't you can you can have this battle if you want. You can put it in front of the courts if you want, but this is still the way it's going to go. Uh, and so, Andrew, do you want to weigh in on the climate and how prominent it was, and and the messaging that that Chantal's pointed to there? It was clearly front and center. This is definitely the centerpiece of the of the throne speech. Uh, I didn't get a much of a read on where they're going with carbon pricing. How high are they going to raise the price? Uh, was left uh, vague. We've got the target of the zero, zero, net zero by 2050, but we don't have a roadmap out how to get there. But I agree with you, um, um, they're certainly not signaling and they wouldn't expect them to do so, that they're backing off on the carbon price at all. Um, I mean, so we went through some of the things that obviously were were attempts to get others on side. They did talk about uh, guns, and they referenced the, the 30th anniversary of the uh, shooting at the Polytechnique, which is tomorrow. Uh, they referenced Pharmacare and an attempt to I implement it. They even talked about uh, trying to keep that trying to win that seat at Security Council at the United Nations that I wasn't convinced that they were still trying to do, but apparently they are. So it, uh, there's not going to be a vote on this, and, the, you know, so it, their, their future is, is fine for, for, <laughs> for quite some uh, uh, time. But, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Chantal. But, uh, there's not going to be a vote, but uh, nothing is preventing an opposition party from, preventing, from presenting a non-confidence motion on the sure. basis of the Trump speech. That sure. tool is always available. But I don't yeah. expect the NDP and yeah. the Bloc to be doing that, uh, but other parties could. So uh, no, minority governments are never safe. But, but you would not expect that this speech would in any way, uh, I don't know, be provocative. Could I'd be? be surprised uh, yeah. if, the, uh, if at least one or maybe two of the third parties do not find a reason or enough reasons to back this speech. Andrew? It, it, it's only provocative to the Conservatives. Uh, and I'll repeat a point I made earlier. What we're not seeing right now in Canadian politics is a contest for the middle ground. Uh, that's probably going to wait until the Conservatives sort out where they're going, where their leader's going. Uh, but it, right now, the Liberals are sim simply focused on rounding up the vote on the left as much as they can, and they'll continue to do so until they feel the heat from the Conservatives. Okay, uh, I'll leave it there with both of you. Uh, I might get back to you before the end of this special, but definitely we'll see you uh, shortly on The National, of course. Thank you, Andrew and Chantel. I want to uh, just remind people that we are looking at that uh, microphone because uh, <laughs> opposition leaders will make their way there. That is the foyer of the House of Commons in the West Bloc, uh, where they will give their reaction. Although, as you heard there from Andrew and Chantal, not, you know, this isn't likely to, uh, it might be provocative uh, for the Conservatives at most, but it's not likely something that's going to get every Everybody, uh, in a fit, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, someone looks like someone's remarks have been delivered, so we'll see. <clears throat> I think it's Andrew Shear who will be up first. Uh, Vashi Capellas is going to head over to the West Block where she is hosting her show, Power and Politics, tonight from 5 to 7 Eastern. So I just want to get one more thought from you before I let you scoot up the street here. I guess. Overall, when you look at it, it's a very it was a very political document or speech, more so maybe than I would have imagined just because of throne speeches aren't usually. But we're in a minority government. Everything is about the next sure. election. And I think that bled through 
they're very much appealing to the parties and the people who voted for the parties that they can win some votes from. Okay, thanks for that, Vashi. Let's listen into Andrew. Weeks, uh, Justin Trudeau has learned the lessons of the last election. Uh, Canadians sent him with the two governments with the weakest mandate in Canadian history. Uh, nous sommes déçus. Uh, Aujourd'hui était une opportunité de signaler aux Canadiens Today was the opportunity to show Canadians that this government has changed said, direction. Just seeing much more of the same. There's nothing in the throne speech talking about preparing Canada for a potential economic downturn with many warning signs on the horizon. Uh, nothing about our energy workers in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Nothing about our forestry workers in British Columbia. Uh, no sense that uh, decisions that were taken in the previous parliament under this government have caused some of the very uh, damage to our society and to Canada. And most importantly, nothing really on national unity. We have a natural unity crisis in our country with the resurgence of the bloc. Sentiments that, uh, that, this, that under this Liberal government, that Confederation is not working for them. But luckily for Canadians, there is a party that is still going to fight to put Canadians first, that still believes in a united Canada, and that there is still someone running for Prime Minister who will put Canadians first and who believes in uniting Canadians, not dividing them. So over the course of tomorrow, when I respond to the throne speech and over the course of the next few days and well into this parliament, uh, the Conservative Party will be showing Canadians how a Conservative government will keep Canada united, help Canadians get ahead and put their needs first. Mr. Scheer, you heard what? You heard what? Throne speech and potentially triggering an election then? Uh, we are very disappointed in this throne speech. We are going to be moving an amendment to it, and we'll see what happens with that amendment. What kind of it, amendment, Mr. Scheer? Well, well, we'll be tabling that tomorrow when I give my response to the throne speech. It will, it, will, it will highlight the things that we believe should have been in this speech. Uh, the missed opportunities that Justin Trudeau had to send the signal that he gets it, that, he, that he's heard from Canadians. Uh, that wasn't in the speech that uh, we saw today, uh, so we will be proposing that tomorrow. Dans le discours du trône, M. Trudeau, M. Trudeau parle, ben, le discours du trône parle bien du, de l'importance well, The throne speech does indeed talk about the importance of uh, taking natural resources to new ma markets. He mentioned that specifically. That's not sufficient to you? Well, no, he did not name the energy sector. And also, he didn't recognize the fact that it is his very legislation, bills uh, 179 and uh, the other, that caused the problem. And I think Canadians need a signal to show that he learned the lesson sent by the election. Yes, in French on this, Mr. Scheer, are you planning to vote against the speech from the throne? What will be your strategy from now? On. Today and tomorrow uh, we will be proposing an amendment and we will see if Parliament passes our amendment. One brief mention of the resource sector in the entire speech, no mention of Alberta or Saskatchewan. What is this government's message to Canadians in those provinces? It's an extremely negative message. Uh, Justin Trudeau is, has caused the damage that is affecting our natural resource sector, oil and gas sector. Uh, billions of dollars of investment have left Canada, have left the energy sector to be invested in other countries. This notion, this idea that uh, Mr. Trudeau likes to uh, put about that there's some, uh, that the people of Alberta and Saskatchewan are victims of a global uh, phenomenon is just false. Uh, it, Billions of dollars have left, they're being invested in other countries, businesses are going out of business, they're going bankrupt, and they're selling at auction their equipment to American companies to build pipelines and invest in the energy sector in the United States. So today's throne speech was, uh, I believe, an insult to the people of Alberta and Saskatchewan for not recognizing uh, the, 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 the anger and the sentiments uh, that exist there. Right Do you think now. this is going to drive deeper, those concerns about separatism growing, especially in Alberta? So I am worried that Mr. Trudeau's entire approach is sending a very negative signal to uh, many parts of this country, uh, that, he doesn't, that he doesn't understand the, 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 the feelings that exist in, in several provinces. Uh, luckily, uh, the Conservative Party stands ready to show Canadians how we will ensure that Canada works, how we will put forward concrete proposals that bring our country closer together. We believe in a, a united Canada and we will work very hard. Well, do you think the first amendment has anything to do with Alberta? You'll, you'll, you'll see our amendment tomorrow when we when do you support for plans, but you can't tell us what they are Concrete right plans for? We want to put forward concrete examples of how you would do better. Can you give us yeah, one well, example today? Absolutely. Repealing Bill C-69 and Bill C-48. Starting the work for a national energy corridor. That will address the environmental and First Nations concerns so that we can 
get big projects built in this country again. Uh, elements of our of our environmental plan that would uh, uh, accelerate investments in research and technology, helping uh, the energy sector grow while at the same time reducing emissions. We had uh, we have many of those types of ideas, and you'll see more of them in the weeks. Do you support ahead. any of the? Mais, mais on a deux problèmes. C'est une en l'Ouest du Canada, mais au Québec aussi. Mais il y a des nouveaux députés blocistes parce que there are new il y a block un MPs au Québec. Because there is this new feeling, feeling in Quebec to, uh, tending to support a sovereignist party. Maybe you shouldn't name 10 provinces and three territories in the speech from the throne, but send Canadians a signal that the government and the prime minister recognize that there is a problem today in this country. Climate plan specifically. Is there anything in what the Liberals are saying on climate change policy wise that you support? I did see a mention to uh, something that we had proposed around attracting investment uh, uh, around business development, about uh, investments in technology. We'll see what that looks like. Obviously, in a throne speech, you don't see uh, all the details, but there was a mention uh, to that. Uh, so we'll see where they go with that. You've talked about the Bloc Québécois twice, whereas it's not they who are threatening national unity, if I understand correctly. In the current situation in Canada, it's the Western provinces headed by Alberta and the separatist movement. So why do you keep harping on the Bloc Québécois? Well, in this parliament, there is a party whose platform is independence. That's clear. We offered Quebecers concrete measures because we showed respect to Quebec and we gave the Quebec government many powers concerning culture and immigration. And we offered that Quebecers should be preparing one single tax return. But Mr. Trudeau rejected many of those ideas. So clearly, the Conservative Party can improve on the situation and improve on the national unity situation. But Quebecers also rejected your ideas. You lost two seats in Quebec and uh, your, your vote total in Quebec dropped as well. Well, when we face a situation, well, the Bloc Québécois was almost finished uh, through two parliaments, and now with Justin Trudeau as prime minister over four years, they're still here. So my work and the work of our team for the next few months is to show Quebecers and uh, and to show all Quebecers and all of Canada, in uh, people in every region, that we can govern this country while respecting all the regions and provinces. the course of the next few weeks and months, for as long as this parliament may last, or as short as it may last, how a Conservative government will govern this country in the best interests of every province and every region. Justin Trudeau has divided this, uh, this country. He has divided this country. He has pitted region against region. That is not the way to keep this confederation together, and we will show Canadians a better Way. Merci beaucoup. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. All right. That's uh, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer, the first to respond to that throne speech, saying that he is, quote, disappointed uh, and that he will respond uh, during the, the actual debate around the throne speech and propose an amendment, which is just part of the of how the throne speech unfolds, the debate unfolds. Aaron, thoughts on that? I thought it was interesting to hear him say he was running, or he referred to himself as running for to be prime minister, which is technically the campaign's over. Uh, and, but I think it is still the situation for Andrew Scheer that uh, at least until April, he is effectively campaigning to keep his job and to show why he should be going into the next campaign as the Conservative leader. i got to interrupt you just for a moment, because at this point we do have to say goodbye to our friends in Newfoundland uh, who and Labrador, who are now going to tune in for their uh, local newscasts if you want to continue watching, though. Uh, in the other parts of the country, you are welcome to do that, and of course on CBC News Network. Thank you for watching Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, okay, I will let you. You have. You can't. You can't ignore them because they get really upset when you forget Never. to say goodbye to them. So. Uh <laughs> It, I, I mean, as I said to you as he was talking, uh, it was probably the first scrum I have seen since the election where there was no question about him. Right. Uh, uh, so that I would do, be a little moment of relief for I him. I do think that one of the well, one of the things that made life 
more difficult for Andrew Scheer over the last uh, month and a half is that there wasn't a parliament. Yes. Uh, I don't think the government uh, intended it this way, but by creating this this sort of gap between the election and parliament returning and normal business resuming, uh, it left a vacuum that Andrew Scheer uh, ended up filling, uh, probably not to his uh, desire. But uh, he is, I, even beyond the campaigning, he is hitting on issues that he's going to be able to challenge the government on. Uh, the resource sector, national unity, the economy. Uh, you know, it is probably a bit too early to start planning for a recession, but uh, any signs of weakness in the economy, that's where Andrew Scheer is going to be able to hit this government. Okay. Uh, Salima Shivji is standing by with the president of the Inuit Tamparit Kanatami, uh, Natan Obed. Salima. Standing here with Natan Obed, obviously president of ITK Inuit Tamarit Kanatami. Uh, what did you make of the, the the sections in the throne speech that were, ta were talking about reconciliation, that the path uh, forward continues? There's a few details in terms of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. What's your reaction to that? Oh, that is um, excellent news. That this government will co-develop legislation on the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, the one-year window for the co-development is ambitious, but that's what we want. Uh, we also think to take very seriously the term co-development. So we will work starting today, I'll be calling PMO a bit later, to talk about how co-development can happen without some of the pitfalls and challenges that we had in the co-development process in the last couple of is that a strong enough signal that they're serious about continuing with reconciliation just because of that time frame? It is an ambitious time frame. Absolutely. It shows that that legislative piece is a, as a focus of this government, and that is a, an excellent sign for the continued reconciliation uh, efforts that we are engaging with as First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Uh, I thought the term Indigenous was used uh, well throughout. I would have hoped to hear more specific uh, distinctions-based language throughout the throne speech. But again, we're all learning. So uh, in some of those areas, especially in regards to infrastructure, the implementation of the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, uh, the, uh, the Health Act that was promised in the Liberal Platform, these are all pieces that uh, weren't specifically in the throne speech, but as Inuit, we will be following up with government on Yes, thanks for your report. Natan Obed, uh, president of ITK. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Salima. Let's go to the lobby of the West Bloc, and that is, of course, the Bloc Québécois leader, Yves-François Blanchet. Let's listen in to him. Has its own jurisdiction, and there, uh, there is jurisdiction that is uh, solely provincial or territorial. And by insisting on talking about regions, that is almost about like taking out the fact that those provinces have their own parliaments, and that the government could interfere in there. Well, we're talking about broad principles, but we realize that they talked about student uh, care or uh, daycare and uh, issues that, at first sight are of uh, provincial jurisdiction. And there is the health care issue. The government said we will be helping uh, Canadians have access to doctors. Well, the Canadian government doesn't hire doctors. Quebec will hire doctors, hire health care providers. Quebec hires nurses. And Quebec, like all other premiers of uh, Canada, is asking for an increase in the health transfer. But the federal government is turning a deaf ear to that by saying, well, they want to know, to tell us what to do. Well, they may be polite, but what they're saying is not necessarily true. The government, and I salute them for this, because they are agreeing that they will start compensating farmers who are affected, who are under the supply management system. But some things have to be spelled out. The payments this time around it should be renewable over the eight-year period, which is in clear so far. The processes who are managed by, who are under supply management should also be compensated. And especially, we must ensure that agriculture, and in particular the supply management sector, will no longer be sacrificed during trade negotiations. I expected that to come out clearly in the speech from the throne because there is broad consensus on that. Finally, 
there is this absence. Well, virtually, there is virtually absent from the speech from the throne. And I'm talking about the word oil. Well, the oil, the word oil, the oil is in there, but the word isn't in there. I found this sentence extraordinary. Under climate change, they wrote, the government will work equally hard in order to take Canadian resources to new markets and will provide permanent support to the men and women working hard in the natural resources sectors in Canada, where many areas have faced difficulties lately. Well, we understand that the Prime Minister is addressing Albertans and Saskatchewan people and uh, hoping that by not, use, by not using the word oil, that will help uh, uh, lay some fears. It almost works. Well, natural resources to be exported it should include uh, Quebec's uh, uh, forestry products and uh, mining products, as well as Quebec's hydroelectricity. So, I feel that I expect that that is where the, the efforts should be focused. As you know, there, is, there are two other things that I wanted to raise concerning indigenous rights. I feel that there was the need, which I feel might be sincere, that is, the sincere need to recognize the fact that indigenous nations are full, full nations, and if being a nation is good for Canada, it's good for Quebec, well, it should be good for all indigenous nations, and that should be recognized, and uh, we should put an end to the paternalism that we all deplore, but the desire to work on, to uh, apply the UN declaration is something that I welcome, but when the Prime Minister talked about human rights and uh, concerns about human rights, well, this is the day after he boasted about his great friendship with Mr. Sanchez uh, uh, in a tweet. I find that so inconsistent, and that is in Spain, where people's human rights are being uh, violated, people are being jailed because of a referendum, and then they say they, uh, and uh, Mr. Trudeau says uh, he's a champion of human rights and Spain is his friend. Well, I would like him to be more consistent. And finally, the issue that you're obviously interested in, as you know, you can vote against something that has been named, but it's hard to vote against something that hasn't been mentioned. So I, how do I vote against the word that is not in the speech from the throne, the word oil? Because when we read the, the, the text, we feel as if we're being, uh, our leg is being pulled, I don't want to be crude. Yeah, please, don't uh, push Don't push it, because I might go there. What I am saying, it's hard to vote against something that is not in a speech. Consequently, since they, they try to be vague, we'll make it what we want to make of it. We'll act, uh, act according to what we committed to doing to Quebecers, that is to serve Quebecers and uh, Quebec interests. I see in the wording of this speech avenues that will enable me to make some gains because we're now 32 MPs and we have a strong mandate to make gains for Quebec. And, uh, okay, that's uh, the leader of the Bloc Québécois, Yves-François Blanchette. Uh, he has not yet stopped speaking in order to take a question. So uh, <laughs> I've given him enough time to say his piece at this point, I, I feel. Uh, they, of course, uh, won 32 seats in, in the election a month and a half ago. So have some newfound power and obviously uh, new, new things to say. The, the large point, I think, that Mr. Blanchette made uh, was that oil was not explicitly mentioned, pipelines not explicitly mentioned in this throne speech, but it's still something that's of concern to him. Um, I want to go back with, with that issue one more time before I let them go and, and regroup before they have to do uh, the national. Um, Chantal, maybe I'll let you riff on uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet again. Didn't get any questions because he was just talking away, <laughs> enjoying his moment. <laughs> yes, but, but he did say something that yes. uh, goes to the absence of the words Trans Mountain or Pipeline because uh, just after you cut off, he said, if that word, you can't vote against something that isn't there. That's right. uh, and if that word had been there, it would have been a problem, a major problem for the bloc, but it isn't. Right. Uh, and on this, he's choosing to read it, to read the paragraph about getting resources to market in the larger sense of the word. Mm -hmm. What I didn't get from all these words is 
what he's going to be voting uh, on on the Trump speech, whether he's bringing in an amendment. Those mm -hmm. amendments basically will lead to votes. So, right. um, right. I, but he had a lot to say, but uh, he didn't sound like someone who couldn't swallow yeah. most of the Trump speech, yeah. in part because the liberals fudged the pipeline thing. Yeah, I mean, as you rightly pointed out before, that if you remove those trigger words uh, and the block even knows that you haven't put them in there to, to make them happy, it, do it doesn't matter. It's hard, to, it's hard to make a stink about something if it's not explicitly mentioned. Andrew, one more thought from you on, on where we're left now. Well, he's, nevertheless, who's kidding who here? He's, he would be mad if they'd said the word oil. Uh, the, the phrase about they were going to move resources to markets, that's clearly about oil. So he's agreeing to look the other way like a, yes. a you know. Yes. But I would be more concerned, I think, about the reaction that uh, Andrew Scheer was voicing. If you were watching this speech in Alberta or Saskatchewan, uh, you would have seen very little to assuage your concerns about whether, in fact, the government of Canada was trying to put you out of business. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they're going to build the pipeline, but the other concerns are, are still there. I'm not saying that necessarily the government has to assuage those concerns, but, but, yeah. but clearly this, there was very little in this speech that was going to address the reasons why people voted overwhelmingly against the Liberals in those provinces. Okay, I will now bid you goodbye for this part of the special. Uh, you can see Chantal and, uh, and Andrew and Aaron uh, later on The National. They will do an ad issue and give you their take after they've had a few more minutes to think about things. Thank you both very much. Talk to you soon. Uh, I'm going to go back to David Cochran now. He is in the uh, West Block over where the House of Commons is and has been talking to people as well and uh, just wanted to get your impressions too, David, of, of you know, we sort of done the rounds here on climate change was certainly a big deal. You, you heard there from Andrew and Chantal, uh, I guess, some of the concerns that, that Andrew Scheer was expressing around places maybe in this country. They didn't hear what they needed to hear. Uh, what, what struck you or what are people telling you? Well, uh, Rosary, really, this strikes me as a fairly predictable throne speech with some fairly predictable reaction. I mean, the government has been signaling for quite some time, really since Justin Trudeau's first news conference after the election, that this is a progressive government. This views this as a progressive parliament. They think the electorate is progressive, so they're going to advance a progressive agenda. And that's why there's efforts in here on things like a nod to the NDP on being open to dental care and taking steps on pharmacare, though I suspect Jagmeet Singh will say something about wanting to see more specifics on those. Uh, but they recognize that the path to making this work is by tilting left and not necessarily uh, trying to appease some of the concerns being raised by Andrew Scheer. I mean, it is not surprising that Mr. Scheer would come out and say he's deeply disappointed in this throne speech. I mean, he is fighting to save his job. He is not going to really do anything to help Justin Trudeau do his job. Uh, so it, it's not surprising to see that there. But it should be important. It's important to note, Rosemary, that is a minority parliament. The government could fall because it does not have a majority, but it is in nobody's interest in that parliament to go to a quick election at all. They don't have yeah. the money, they don't have the resources, the appetite isn't there internally inside the parties or externally with the electorate. Canadians are here to make this work, so we'll see a lot of rhetoric, an amendment from Andrew Scheer tomorrow sure. that may force some kind of a vote on the throne speech, uh, but despite what we hear today, I don't think you'll see any meaningful steps to try to defeat Justin Trudeau anytime soon. Okay, David, thanks for that. We'll uh, check back with you shortly as you uh, talk to more people and uh, get a sense of what they're saying or what they're about to say. I'll go back to uh, Aaron here. Yves-Francois Blanchette is still speaking. <laughs> so we may never He's hear from his another party speech. leader ever again, actually. Um, just, just picking up on something uh, David said there, I, you know, I, I understand that the, the speech may not go over well with, say, MPs from Alberta or Saskatchewan, where the Liberals were completely shut out. At the same time, I, 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 you know, you're not, you're not actually improving Conservative fortunes if that's all you're defending, right? So you, you get into that sort of rock and a hard place that the Conservative, regardless of who the leader is going to be, will find themselves in. You cannot, if the Liberals push you into a place where all you're doing is defending a region, like the Bloc Québécois, you, you are going to be as stuck as they are, uh, perhaps in a more serious way. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have put that stuff in the throne speech. That you know, maybe they should have been more explicit to those provinces. But but you can you can sort of see the trap being laid in ways as well. Yeah, I, I think though it works a bit. I think both both parties have have a bit of a weakness here, right? As you say, they, the Conservatives can't just be defending Alberta and Saskatchewan's interests. Although, going into a leadership vote, uh, Andrew Scheer may be wagering that Has Alberta that. and Saskatchewan Conservatives are the sort of people he needs to turn out yeah. for him. Uh, the Liberals, though, on the other hand, can't completely ignore the issue, and they will be measured in terms of 
uh, their emphasis on the West, on 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 how explicitly they're reaching out to the West. That will that will be the frame for almost everything they do going forward. Uh, you know, anytime they act on climate, the question will be, well, what does that mean for the West? This is this is sort of the dialogue that uh, is just going to play out over the next little while. But the reason that they talked so much about climate, the reason the throne speech was so it's so climate heavy was because they believe that this election sent a message about climate change, right. that the vast majority, what is it, two-thirds, three-quarters of Canadians voted in some way for stronger climate action. And given the Conservatives didn't have that on the table, they're going to take that and run with it. Yeah, it's the fun climate change became in this election the fundamental split between the political left and the political right. Uh, and uh, the political left at this point is 60 percent uh, of people who voted for a party that... Uh, uh, wanted to implement a price on carbon. And if you're the Liberals and you're looking at it and saying, okay, well, where can we grow our bait? Where can we grow our support? It's to the left. Uh, you know, if you go back to, to, to the Pierre Trudeau situation in 72 that we referenced earlier, where he was also knocked down to a minority, getting knocked down to a minority gave him a bit of an excuse to become a bit more of a progressive mm -hmm. prime minister. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a bit of that here too, yeah. where uh, Justin Trudeau now has an excuse to, to, to lean on climate change as the issue. Uh, for political reasons, for his own sort of legacy, uh, that's where he's got to go. Uh, but it's always going to come back to, in his case, yes, we're gonna, you're going to move forward on climate change, and yes, that's where your vote is, yeah. that's where you can grow your, your, uh, your majority maybe for the next election. But how do you do that and bring along the West? Uh, because as Andrew said earlier, yeah, sure, uh, there aren't maybe, you know, 20 seats for the, for the Liberals to win in Alberta and no, Saskatchewan, no. but there is a price to be paid both uh, politically and historically for, for anyone who seems to be sort of endangering national unity. Okay. Yves-Francois Blanchette is still talking, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to dip back in to see what kinds of questions he's getting. <laughs> Now, concerning the health uh, commitments in the uh, speech from the throne, do you find that those commitments are too interventionist? Yes, but the fact is it remains a speech from the throne. Uh, increasing access to uh, physicians and uh, all that and uh, working on pharma care, well, it has to stay general in the nature of throne speech. Provincial premiers and the premier of Quebec met, and I remember two things from that meeting. There was a request to increase the health transfer by 5.2 percent per year, but the federal government turned a deaf, a deaf ear to that demand from the provinces and Quebec to that, and said, "Well, we want to make a qualitative and a quantitative health investments." There is also a demand made by the provinces and Quebec that environmental pro pro uh, assessments in Quebec should have uh, uh, the primacy over the federal uh, environmental assessment, and the federal government also turned a deaf ear to that. My reasoning is that by uh, talking uh, uh, broadly about Canadian regions, the government is ignoring the fact that all those provinces and territories have governments and parliaments or uh, uh, provincial assemblies with their own jurisdictions, and the federal government keeps looking for ways to intervene. And uh, the provinces and Quebec will keep having to fight to protect okay. their jurisdiction. No. The one time he was going to speak English, I dipped out. I, I apologize. I, I, it's fascinating to hear the leader of the Bloc Québécois, because the Bloc, of course, had been so weakened for uh, so long, and now, uh, you know, up 22 seats, up to 32 seats, uh, and able to weigh in on, on Quebec interest. And it seems there, at the end of that part, that Yves-François Blanchet was suggesting that there's some interventionism happening on the part of the federal government if it's trying to defend regions, which, of course, is something that doesn't go over well with the Bloc, and, in fact, a lot of Quebecers at all. Let's go back to David Cochran, who's uh, near where Yves-François Blanchet was still speaking, is still speaking, uh, with one final thought on, on where you think this sort of positions the government uh, right now and, and whether it did, I guess, what it needed to do in terms of messaging for Canadians. 
Well, it certainly is going back to that whole idea that the liberals view this as a progressive electorate, a progressive country, and a progressive parliament, and, and that's who they're trying to reach out to in this. Uh, the person we know they did not convince is Andrew Shear, Rosie, and I've been speaking to some conservatives because Shear dropped that news uh, in his availability earlier that he's going to be tabling an amendment of some sort or proposing an amendment of some sort tomorrow to the throne speech. Well, Yves Francois Blanchet said he couldn't necessarily vote against this because it didn't have the word oil in it or didn't have the word pipeline in it. I think after the amendment it may have oil, pipeline, and TMX. What we're hearing now is that this is something that the, the Conservancy is absent from the throne speech right now, and Mr. Scheer may make an attempt to put at least the word pipeline and TMX and a commitment to the Trans Mountain expansion into the throne speech when he rises for his formal response in the House of Commons tomorrow. So it's not there right now in the text as written by the Prime Minister's office and as delivered by the Governor General, uh, but if Andrew Scheer gets to take a pen to this and, and do some editing of his own, uh, you're going to see him attempt to put that in or at least force it to a vote by proposing an amendment in the House of Commons. Right. But the vote itself uh, won't, won't be a confidence vote unless he also stipulates in some way that he wants to make something a confidence vote, and we don't think that'll happen. So it'll be, it'll be symbolic, but important to the people that want to see that language there. Yeah, and I think you're going to see, look, a lot of symbolism, a lot of messaging. I mean, the, the campaign is officially over, but the Conservatives with Mr. Scheer are really kind of in an unofficial leadership campaign where he has yeah. to deliver strong messages not just to provinces, but to the base within the Conservative Party as the clock ticks down to that April uh, date uh, for him at, at the Conservative Convention in Toronto. And look, who knows when the next election will be. I mean, the Bloc have said they would like this to go several years. When you've just come out with 30-plus seats in Quebec after being on death's door for a while, you don't want to push those chips back into the middle of the uh, of the Quebec political craps table because it could go bust on you pretty fast. So you are going to see a lot of positioning and a lot of rhetoric, but any serious attempts to really curtail the government and, and force this, it's simply not realistic at this point in time. Okay, David Cochran, thanks for your help throughout this special. Thanks. I'll see you later on The National. Uh, let's go to Salima Shivji for one last thought about her impressions. Oh, hang on, Salima. I have to t I'm going to go to Jagmeet Singh first, if you don't mind. NDP leader is up at the mic now, finally. Let's get a bit of his reaction. We'll come see you in a minute. words, but not any concrete actions. We just got through a campaign where people told us that they can't afford their medication. Millions of Canadians are making difficult choices to cut their pills in half or to skip taking the medication they need to stay healthy. We know that so many Canadians cannot find a place to call home. That young people are worried about the future of our planet. There is a climate crisis going on. Indigenous people continue to face injustice and this government is taking Indigenous kids to court. What do we see in this throne speech? They said there were national pharmacare, but they didn't commit to their own report, which says it should be public and single payer and universal. No commitment there. They talked about housing, but they said they're going to continue to do what they're doing. Continue to do what they're doing means spending 19% less as a portion of GDP than the Conservatives before them. They talk about reconciliation, but they have not mentioned stopping taking Indigenous kids to court. And with a climate crisis, we need concrete action, which means science-based targets with accountability to meet those targets and also ending fossil fuel subsidies. We've not seen that type of action. Instead, again, we're just seeing the nice words and, and a signal that they're willing to talk to us. And yes, we're willing to talk, but after seeing that throne speech, we need to talk, because it's not good enough. We need some firmer commitments. We need some real action to tackle the urgent problems that people are facing, not just saying the right words, but following it up with more details. Donc, uh, dans ce discours, so in this speech, the speech from the throne, it was clear that it's not enough to solve the problems people are facing concerning uh, the climate, climate crisis. We hear beautiful words, but without any concrete steps, because we need uh, daring uh, targets. And for indigenous peoples, they keep taking them to their kids to court. And on pharmacare, something that is so crucial, they use the terminology, but without accepting the same report that states that it should be public and universal, which is something that will help a lot of people. And with dental care, they talked about it as something positive, but they said that it will be a parliament's uh, role to explore it. That doesn't go far enough. So we're ready to work together, we want to work together, but what they, they've offered so far is not sufficient.
Allez-vous voter pour ou contre Allez-vous voter pour ou contre Are you going to vote for or against the speech from the throne For now, let's say it's not sufficient, it's not enough. We're ready to talk. I'm ready to talk in order to build on those, those promises and to get more details on those promises, but right now that's not sufficient. For these conversations before the vote, basically, is that what you're trying to do? Yes, absolutely. At this point in time, uh, we are not satisfied with what we're hearing. But our goal, as always, is not to tear down government. I don't want to seek ways to put us back into election, but I want to seek ways to make this government work for people. And right now, this is not what people need. People need real commitments. These are real crises that people are faced with. And what they're offering okay, that gives you a is sense not of, uh, the NDP's the position. Uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh saying uh, this isn't quite what he wants, but he's willing to have a conversation, which is probably good enough, frankly, for the government at this point. Uh, let's go to Salima Shivji. She's inside the Senate building with one last thought of uh, your first impressions of your first throne speech, Salima. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was really struck by, as David has said and others have said before me, that very much that focus on the progressive government and the stuff that we heard all the time on the campaign trail. Really, everything that it was said in this throne speech on climate action has already was already announced. Uh, no further details on, on that. It was, yes, my first time covering a throne speech. Also, the first time uh, Governor General Julie Payette gave the throne speech. And I thought, her insertion, adding a few, a bit of flair, astronaut, former astronaut flair was quite interesting, talking about planetary spaceships and space-time continuum, and that's causing a bit of a flutter on social media as well. All right, Salima, thank you for your help with our coverage today. Appreciate it. Talk again soon. Aaron Weary, I'm just going to thank you. Thanks. But that's it. Right. Uh, but I'll see you later on At Issue. Thank you very much for being here and joining me and braving the cold. Uh, thanks to everybody that helped with the special, all of our reporters, our producers, our crew. I always forget to thank them. Everybody in the control room, my executive producer. You can watch more coverage coming up right in just a few moments here on CBC News Network with Bashi Capellas and Power and Politics. We'll have more coverage on the throne speech, including At Issue on The National tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 in Newfoundland. Thank you for watching. The 43rd session of Canada's Parliament is now open for business. This has been the throne speech here in the nation's capital in Ottawa. I am Rosemary Barton on behalf of CBC News and everyone here. Thank you for watching. See you later on The National.